in this area. And this event is sponsored by the Comsoc Communication Theory Technical Community uh, and the OTFS SIG. So I think first, uh, Professor Peter Hong, will you do a welcoming remark on behalf of the CTPC? So Peter, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, wait there. Thank you for yeah, organizing the event. Um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, explain a little bit about this event. So this is the second uh, CTTC uh, two plus one event. Uh, this event was uh, initi initiated by our vice chair, uh, Petar Popovsky, um, with the intention to, you know, uh, let people stay engaged uh, during this pandemic and also, you know, learn new things along the way. So the format is that, you know, we typically have, you know, two speakers uh, to introduce the topic first, and then we'll have a, you know, a panel discussion to, you know, discuss some uh, potential challenges and research directions. Yeah, so uh, we hope to have many of these events along the way. So if you are interested in organizing one of them, uh, please let us know and we'll help you, you know, work things out. Okay, thank you. And thanks to Wei Jie for, for today's event. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And thanks for the opportunity to co-organize this event with CTTC. Uh, so today we will have two invited talks, uh, both one hour talk uh, provided by Roni Hadani and Emmanuel Viterbo. And then we will have an open OTFS panel discussion and we have invited five experts to serve as panelists. And we have also collected some questions before. And so we can have some discussions on this, uh, the, the, the questions. Uh, so first, let's welcome Professor Roni Hadani to give this first invited talk. The title is OTFS uh, Paradigm for Delayed Doppler Communication. Uh, so let me have a brief introduction of Roni. Roni Hadani receives the PhD degree in pure mathematics from Tel Aviv University. And his expertise is in representation theory and harmonical analysis with applications to uh, signal processing. He is the mathematical visionary who together with uh, Rakib and created the groundbreaking orthogonal time frequency space wireless modulation scheme and founded the company Cohere. He leads the Cohere's research into the capabilities of OTFS and other advanced wireless technologies and how they can enable the next generation of wireless services. So in addition to being Cohere's chief scientific officer, Roni still serves as an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so let's welcome Roni to give his talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, I will stop sharing, Roni. Okay, so now I can, I can share. One sec. So I, I'm sharing now. Do you uh, see yes, my yes. screen? Yeah, sure. Um, one second. Uh, I don't, well, I don't see you. Can you see me? One second. Uh, yeah, we can see you clearly. I do share screen. Oh, so I share. Okay. Oh, here. And now if I do from the beginning, now you can see me and uh, all right, the, the screen uh, is shown. Um, all right, um, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a true pleasure to, to be in this uh, virtual uh, meeting. It's not a conference, it's just a friendly meeting of people which are interested in OTFS, uh, nothing better than that. Um, so I have the pleasure to introduce OTFS to you and I will try to do it the best I can. Um, and really what my goal is, this is a talk that I already gave in different forums, but it's very, it, it's very organic every time I, I, I change it a little bit. Um, but really my goal in this talk is not to tell you anything specifically technical about OTFS. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to equalize OTFS. I'm not going to teach you how to do MU MIME on OTFS uh, and et cetera. And my goal is really to, 
to tell you, to give you the insights about the nature of the beast, what, what OTFS is, so that after you hear what I, what, what, I, what I have to say, you will have certain level of confidence that OTFS is a real object, it's, it has a real mathematical essence, and, um, and you will understand how it behaves and why uh, and whether it is interesting to study it further and, 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 and contribute into the science which is developing around it. So, so really this is my goal and, uh, and, 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 and it's very gratifying to see that there is a growing amount of science which is building around OTFs. Um, again, just to make sure everybody can hear me, just to EG, just uh, let me know. Yes, yes, yes. It's very clear. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, okay. So, second. So first of all, uh, we need to answer the question of what OTFS is. Um, so okay. So so so, so OTFS is a, is a modulation technique. It's it's a, it's a waveform. The, the the name OTFS stands for orthogonal time frequency in space. And this is quite an arbitrary name. Uh, it is historically given. Uh, I don't even remember the reason. Um, but uh, that's the name and it's now there and, and we cannot change it. Um, but uh, what OTFS really is, and it should be viewed as a paradigm of communication uh, that is in the delay Doppler domain. And this should be contrasted with the traditional paradigm which cast communication in the time frequency domain. And the, there is a certain relation between the delay Doppler domain and the time frequency domain, some kind of a duality relation, symplectic duality relation. We'll talk a little bit about that. Casting communication theory, I would even say more than that, not even communication theory, but signal processing, doing signal processing in the delay Doppler domain. So that's what OTFS is. It's a paradigm of doing signal processing in the delay Doppler domain. Um, there are three aspects uh, to this paradigm. Uh, the first aspect is modeling and processing the wireless channel in the delay Doppler domain. And this gives rise to what we call the delay Doppler channel representation. And this is something that is quite well known in the communication uh, community and also in the radar community. So I'll talk a little bit about that. The second uh, aspect of this paradigm, which is a little bit more subtle and complementary, is how to multiplex the information in the delay Doppler domain. And this gives rise to a modulation technique, which we call OTFS, and that's basically a waveform. And we are going to study this waveform. And this waveform has a lot of uh, interesting and intriguing pro properties. And the third aspect, which is becoming more and more popular, is that on the most fundamental level, OTFS, the OTFS paradigm is constitute a mathematical unification between communication and radar uh, theory. And in this sense, it established a very conv a convenient framework for doing joint communication and sensing, which again, it's, it's, it's becoming some kind of an interesting application in a future uh, communication uh, system. Now, just as a side note, um, I get every time ResearchGate sends me alerts about publications on OTFS, and I'm, it's, it's quite astonishing to see that since the first publication that was published in end of 2017, there are now north more than 300 scientific publications. And as I speak, there are more and more. So a lot of activity in a relatively short period of time but uh, a lot of activity on the one hand, and as I'm going to, as I hope that you will see from this meeting, there is much more things to do than what was already done. So there is a lot of future potential here for people to contribute and to expand the science in OTFS. It's really a, a, a fresh ground for people who do research in communication theory. You can actually go and go and make a step in every direction and you will say something new. So in this respect, it's very exciting, I think. So, so let's start by talking a little bit about um, the delay Doppler channel representation. Uh, again, this is not the main topic of my presentation, but I think it is important to speak about it at least briefly because this encapsulates 
in a sense, the whole motivation about the development of OTFS to begin with. When we started to develop OTFS 12 years ago, this delayed Doppler channel representation, this is the one thing that we had in mind which guided us into the mathematical construction of OTFS. So the main observation, the main observation is that uh, the wireless channel is not an arbitrary collection of complex numbers. As, as you, you might think. Uh, it is governed by some straightforward physics. You have some finite collection of reflectors. Some of them are static, some of them are moving. You transmit a wave, uh, the wave propagates to the medium, which in this, in this case is the atmosphere, and bounce off each of the reflectors. And what you get on the received side is just a superposition of these reflections, okay? Now, um, mathematically speaking, every uh, reflection introduces a small distortion, which is a combination of time delay, which relates to the range of the reflector, and Doppler shift, which relates to the velocity of the reflector. So you can represent or index or parameterize each reflector as a pair of delay and Doppler and a certain uh, complex number which represents the complex gain of the reflector. So all in all, you can map this geometry of reflectors into a kind of a two-dimensional impulse response on the delay Doppler plane. That's what you see on the left here. And in this impulse response, every tap in this response represents a cluster of reflectors of specific delay and Doppler characteristics. So for example, on the picture on the left, you see two dominant reflectors which basically have the same delay, but different Doppler. So these are two reflectors which are of the same distance from you, but have different velocity. And this is in fact a real channel response. I think we measured it six or seven years ago when Shlomo, my, my co-founder, drove the car and uh, we did all these measurements. So this is really in the beginning. So this is a real channel measurement, just as a curiosity. So I hope that you see the one-to-one -one correspondence between the geometry on the right, the schematic geometry of the reflectors, and this uh, two-dimensional input response on the left. Indeed, they are mapped into one another in a very seamless manner. So this is called the delay Doppler channel representation. And the main advantages of the delay Doppler channel, of the delay Doppler channel representation is that it reduces the channel dimensionality in a sense to the maximum extent, extent possible. Uh, you basically reduce the number of parameters to the number of dominant reflectors, which is around 15 for a typical channel. Um, of course, you can argue that there is also a diffuse component. And indeed, there is. So the channel is slightly more complicated than just a sporadic or specular collection of reflectors, but the reflectors indeed make a very substantial contribution of the channel response. And, and in this representation, you really see the dominant parameters and they are few, okay? And once you understand that, then and you process the channel in this uh, coordinate system, it leads to efficiency. You can, if you do the right signal processing, you can efficiently acquire the channel in this coordinate system. You don't need to spend a lot of capacity in, uh, in sensing the channel. You can efficiently predict it. Once you decompose the channel into its constituent reflectors, you can predict it both in time and in frequency because the particular reflector is more predictable than the superposition of the reflector, which you measure in the traditional time frequency uh, coordinate system. And if you do a OTFS, a modulation technique, uh, and you equalize the channel in the delayed Doppler domain, I argue, not I, we probably, uh, that in fact it leads to efficient equalization of the channel. You are dealing with a sparse and compact structure and you can develop efficient equalizers to mitigate the effect on the information. So uh, that's, that's the delayed Doppler channel representation. And um, so let me reiterate because this is, I believe, important. Um, the channel, the main observation, is that the wireless channel um, is in fact governed by a geometric parameter. So although the channel might look very dynamic and unpredictable in time or in frequency, if you view it in, in the delay Doppler coordinate system, it becomes a, a, a rather static object. You have collection of reflectors. Every reflector 
uh, is characterized by its range, its velocity, which corresponds to Doppler, and some propagation loss. And, and indeed, there is a phase which is rapidly changing, but if you ignore this phase, the delay, the Doppler, and the propagation loss are uh, slowly changing parameters. They are very stable parameters that, that represent the channel. And these parameters can be learned, these parameters can be predicted, and this parameter can be uh, processed efficiently and effectively, uh, both um, in time and in frequency. So, so these are the parameters that you want to learn about the channel and uh, apply. Um, so, so, so this is really a, a main point to remember. So once you accept the fact that the delay Doppler coordinate system is the correct coordinate system to represent the channel, a natural a conclusion or wish is to place the information itself in the same coordinate system in a manner which is compatible with the delay Doppler channel representation. And turns out that there is a mathematical consistent way to do that. And this is a, the OTFS modulation technique. So the OTFS modulation technique is a mathematical method to multiplex or to place the information bits or the information QAM symbol on the same delay Doppler coordinate system. But it, it, in, it involves a certain uh, subtlety that I'm going to discuss. So first, let's try to understand where the OTFS modulation technique, or which corresponds to a waveform, fits in the general uh, framework of wireless, which existed so far. So you have three basic waveforms of modulation techniques that were invented in the past 50 years. So you have time division multiple access, TDMA, which carry information over pulses in time. So these are waveforms which are localized in time. Locality is an important word. I will repeat this word again and again, so remember that. And then you have the reciprocal uh, waveform. It's called OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexy, which carry information over tones in time. But really, tones, sinusoidal waves, are a pulses in frequency. So the OFDM waveform is, a, is localized in frequency. Okay, in this sense, it is reciprocal to the TDMA waveform. And then you have a, a, a third modulation, which is CDMA, co-division multiple access, roughly speaking, carry information over waveform which looks like noise. And what makes noise, in, and, and what the characteristic uh, attribute of noise is that it's not localized, not in time and not in frequency and nowhere localized, okay? So in this regard, CDMA stands on the other extreme. It's not localized at all. And, and each one of these waveforms have its own benefits. So every time you move from one of these waveforms to the other, you sacrifice certain benefits and gain some others. So it's not that when people moved from TDMA to OFDM, they only gained something. They lost something. For example, they lost PAPR and got a little bit more the coupling of the channel. And when you sacrifice CDMA, you lost the spreading effect and you lost a certain certain attributes which are beneficial to CDMA. So every time you move from one of these waveforms and, and pick another, it's, it's you know, you, you trade. It's a trading a, a decision. It's not a winning decision. But turns out that if you dig deeper into the, into the science behind this waveform, you realize behind these three waveforms, you realize that they are all, and this is quite surprising, these three waveforms are in fact all mathematical descendants or the generate cases of a single mother waveform, uh, which sits in the middle of this diagram, and, and, and that's the OTFS waveform. So in fact, and I will explain that, the OTFS waveform is a structure which generalizes all these three waveforms. So the OTFS waveform is simultaneously localized in time, it is localized in frequency, and surprisingly enough, it's also spread. <laughs> so, so you get rid, so you, you, you make CDMA localized somewhere, but localized in, in somewhere else, okay? So, so let's move on and talk about how the OTFS waveform looks like, and then explain where does it come from. So first of all, let's use our eyes and see how it looks like. So that's how the OTFS carrier looks like. We call it a pulson, it's a combination of pulse and a tone, 
Uh, so it's the, the OTFS carrier is a tone sampled over a pulse train. It's a finite tone sampled over a pulse train. So it, it goes over a finite duration of time and it has also a finite bandwidth. And this is how it looks like. So a sequence of pulses evenly spaced in time and each pulse is modulated by a phase and the phases are rotating in the IQ plane according to a specific frequency. So that's the pulsar. And this is what carries a single QAM symbol in OTFS. Now, this is a very interesting waveform. Uh, locally, first of all, intuitively, it looks like a pulse. And globally, it looks like a tone. And simultaneously, it behaves like both, as I'm going to explain. And also, uh, when interpreted appropriately, it is spread. Uh, so in particular, it senses all the diversity uh, modes of the channel, and I will explain what does it mean. Um, but on, on the intuitive level, what makes the pulson uh, unique and interesting is that it is invariant under the operations of time delay and Doppler shift. What do I mean by that? If you take a pulson and, and you shift it in time, it preserves its shape. And if you take a pulson and you shift it in frequency, namely you multiply it by a tone, what will happen is that the tone will shift its frequency, but the pulson will preserve its shape. It will just be a different tone. Um, also, another interesting and peculiar property of a pulson is that if you apply a Fourier transform to a pulson, you get a pulson. <laughs> so remember, if you take a Fourier transform of a tone, you get a pulse, and if you apply a Fourier transform to a pulse, you get a tone. But the, Fourier, the, the pulson is a Fourier transform of itself. So it, it, it really it fits in the middle. Um, so it, it's, it's a peculiar waveform. And as you will see, there is a lot of science and mathematics behind it. But the main benefits of this invariant property of this the, is the, the following. Again, still on the intuitive level, that if you have an arbitrary channel environment, reflector, and, and you transmit a pulson through this environment, uh, the pulson is going to interact with the environment so that every reflector is going to shift it in time and shift it in frequency, but the shape of the pulson is oblivious to these distortions. So what you are going to get on the other side is basically a pulson or multiple copies of a pulson uh, shifted in, 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 in the lane in Doppler we are going to see. And this, this has uh, interesting benefits. It means that, that it's like riding a car with good suspension. The, the car goes through a bumpy road, but you don't feel the bumps because the suspensions does just swallow the bumps. So, so the pulson interact with the environment in such a way that you don't feel the environment. You, you somehow, it's like, that's, that's kind of the intuition, or I don't know, the holistic intuition that, that I want you to have about the pulson. So, once the channel condition becomes complicated, the pulson become more and more beneficial uh, waveform to, to use. So of course, for a trivial environment, line of sight, point to point, you can use whatever waveform you want and you will get the same, uh, same performance. But we are talking about extreme scenarios and, and this is where different waveforms will behave differently. Okay. Uh, so again, these invariants translate to performance consistency and robustness under uh, arbitrary channel conditions. So you have an interesting marriage between a mathematical property of symmetry, that's the property of the Poulson, and the engineering uh, wish list of that you want uh, a structure to satisfy. So it's an interesting marriage between math and engineering. And, uh, so in this regard, Okay, so now I'm moving on and I want to tell you where the pulson comes from. So I, I want to convince you that I, the pulson, this tone modulated over a pulse train, is not just something that I invented out of my head. You know, it's not just a picture that I decided to draw one day and now I'm trying to convince you that it is a nice picture. Uh, what I'm trying to convince you now is that the pulson comes from some very fundamental mathematical structures which lie in the fabric of signal processing. It's, it's really, really fundamental structure. Uh, so, so, so that's my goal now. 
So in order to understand where the pulson come from, you really need to go to the fundamentals. You need to revisit the foundations. And the foundations of signal processing is time and frequency. You have two basic dimensions. If you have a signal, you can either represent it as a function of time, or you can represent it as a function of frequency, and these two representations are interchangeable by means of the Fourier transform, okay? Um, but time and frequency are peculiar dimensions. So although many people like to say the time frequency form a plane, this is not by far a correct statement. Time and frequency do not form a plane, at least in the naive sense, because a plane is a place where you can put your finger at a specific x, y coordinate. And in time and frequency, you cannot put your finger at a specific point in the time frequency plane. There is a fundamental mathematical obstruction of doing that. It's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Namely, if you have a signal which is localized in time, let's try that you are trying to localize your attention, small interval in time, what is going to happen that you are going to smear in frequency. You are going to lose localization in frequency. And vice versa, if you will try to really focus your attention on a small interval in frequency, you will lose your uh, focus on time. So you have this trade-off between uh, your focus either on time and in frequency, and this trade-off is governed by the Heisenberg and Thirty principle, which is a fundamental mathematical property, which you cannot avoid. Okay, so in this regard, time and frequency do not form a plane, all right, because in the plane X and Y, you don't say, you can localize in each dimension independently of the other and it, nothing will happen, but not in time and frequency. In time and frequency, you have this kind of trade-off. So this is a fundamental obstruction. But here comes the interesting uh, mathematical insight. Uh, turns out that uh, you can cheat the Heisenberg and Celtic principle. You can cheat, but not violate. Namely, you can localize both in time and in frequency to any desired degree, as long as you are willing to pay a small price, okay? And the price is that you need to extend quasi-periodically, right? And this is what I want to explain to you right now. So in order to do that, you need to form a box in the time frequency plane. We call it the delay Doppler box, okay? And why we call it the delay Doppler box? Again, tradition. But let's call it the delay Doppler box. And um, the width of this box a long time, it's called the delay period. And the width of this box along a frequency is called the Doppler period. And you can choose these periods any way you want, as long as the area of this box is equal one, okay? So you fix these periods and you choose them, but you choose them once, you don't touch them anymore because these are the parameters of the theory, okay? But you form this box, all right? And inside this box, you can construct um, two dimensional pulses and you can make them localized both in time and in frequency simultaneously localized to any desired degree. You can make this pulse even a delta function, okay? But in order not to violate the Heisenberg and Celsius principle, you need to take this pulse and extend it quasi-periodically outside this box. And what do I mean by that? Um, you start with your pulse, and then what you do, you extend it into an infinite configuration of pulse. This is an infinite configuration. It's prolonged everywhere, okay? Outside the box. But this is not a periodic extension of your pulse. It's a quasi-periodic extension, which means that every time you transition from one copy to another copy, you multiply by a phase rotation. You multiply by phase according to specific rule. You cannot do it any way you want. You have to, there are certain rules. I'm not going to bother you with the mathematical definition. Maybe I will show it in the next slide, but you have to apply a phase rotation. So this is this kind of, this is what is called a quasi-periodic uh, 
a quasi-periodic configuration of pulses. And turns out that such a quasi-periodic configuration does not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you can make the fundamental pulse as localized as you want, as long as you extend it quasi-periodically, you do not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, the point is um, that if the delay spread and the Doppler spread of the channel are smaller than the period, then the fundamental pulse is not going to interact with its uh, aliases. So to every, any practical purpose, this quasi-periodic pulse will behave indistinguishably from this ideal non-existent truly localized pulse. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm running ahead of myself, but I'm just giving you some a priori intuition. Why a quasi-periodic pulse is something that behave in a sense indistinguishably from a truly localized signal, which is non-existent. So in a sense, this price that you pay by extending quasi-periodically is not a real price. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything, as long as the delay spread and the Doppler spread of the channel are not too big. And they are not. They are much smaller than the period. That's the physics of, of, of the matter. Okay. So again, let me just, let me just uh, cast it in a different slide. Um, we in fact introduced a, a, a new class of signals uh, and a quasi-periodic uh, pulse is a particular example of a new type of signal which we call the quasi-periodic delay Doppler signal or delay Doppler signal or a quasi-periodic signal. So what is a quasi-periodic signal in general? It's a function on the delay Doppler plane which is quasi-periodic um, which means that if period a long delay you shift by a phase which depends on the Doppler and if you move a period along Doppler you shift by a phase which depends on the delay and you see here the precise formula. Um, so this is a quasi-periodic signal and a quasi-periodic pulse is a particular example of a quasi-periodic signal but you can talk about every quasi-periodic signal and they all form a class of signals. And why am I telling you that? Because this class of signals is very important for signal processing. So what they taught you in signal processing in the university is that you can, that you have the class of signals which are functions in time. And then they talk to you that there are another class of signals which are functions in frequency and they are related by Fourier transform. And what I'm trying to tell you now is that there is another very important class of signals which are quasi-periodic functions in delay doping. And they are also related to the other classes by means of, the, of transformations that we are going to discuss. They are called the Zach transform. But we are talking here about something very fundamental in signal processing. It's another signal representation. It's another class, signal class that you can do signal processing in and try to understand the properties of signal inside this representation. So if you think about frequency, you realize that frequency was invented by Fourier. Frequency did not exist before Fourier came. Time is the physical dimension. Everybody understands what time is, it's, it's intuitively. But frequency is a dimension that was created by Fourier or revealed by And he taught us how to do signal processing in the Fourier domain, and this is very useful. I say that this quasi-periodic delay Doppler have the same status. status. It's a new class of signals where you can do signal processing, and it's very useful. Okay, and it reveals new attributes of signals that you cannot see in the other representation. Okay, so now we have this quasi-periodic pulse and the next question is how to relate a quasi-periodic pulse uh, with, a true sig with a physical signal, with a function of time. Okay, in the same way that you can ask if I have a, a, a pulse in frequency, how, what kind of signal, physical signal correspond to it? Well, well, you have to apply the Fourier transform in that case and you will get a tone. Uh, so let's ask the same question. We have a quasi-periodic pulse. I only show you the fundamental period. We have a quasi-periodic pulse in delay Doppler. What do we need to do in order to realize it as a function of time, as a physical signal? Uh, in analog to, in analogy to, to to OVM, to, to frequency uh, signal processing. Also here, we need to apply a transform. But in this case, the transform is not the Fourier transform, but something which is called the Zach transform. 
And when you apply a, a ZAC transform to a quasi-periodic pulse, what you get is a pulson. <laughs> so, so in other words, uh, the pulson is the time realization of a quasi-periodic pulse in the laser time. Okay? So now you have two different ways to think about the OTFS carrier. You have the concrete way to think about it as a pulson in time. So this is something very concrete, very, uh, you can imagine, you can think about it, it's like you can play with it, but it's not very conceptual, okay? But then you have the more conceptual uh, uh, interpretation of the, of the carrier, and this is as a quasi-periodic pulse in delayed open. And the relation between these two ways of thinking is the Zactron. And this is in complete analogy to Fourier analysis, uh, where you have two different ways to think about the OFDM carrier. You can think about it as a tone in time. It's not a very revealing way to think about it. It's just a very concrete way. Or more conceptually to think about it as a pulse in frequency. And the relation, of course, is, is the Fourier transform in that case. Okay? So now you have these two different ways. And it's very important to be able to jump back and forth between these two ways of thinking. You work with pulsons, you get some very concrete insight about how it behaves, and then you do conceptual kind of uh, mathematics and uh, engineering in the DA Doppler uh, realm in order to see things in clear way and, and, and seamless way. Okay, conceptual explanation. Now it's interesting to understand how these two structures relate to one another in terms of their uh, different attributes. And I think if you understand that, you get a very complete picture or understanding of what is the nature of the OTFS uh, waveform. Um, so first, so, so let me start with the position of the pulse. So it has a certain coordinate in delay and the coordinate in Doppler. So the coordinate in delay of the pulse, which I denote by delta tau, uh, specifies the time displacement of the pulsar. So as you shift the quasi-periodic pulse in delay, as you shift it horizontally, the pulson is going to shift correspondingly in time. Okay? And reciprocally, the Doppler coordinate of the pulse specifies the frequency of the tone. So as you shift the pulse in Doppler, uh, the tone changes its frequency accordingly. Okay? Now you can see the quasi-periodicity here because if you take the pulse and you shift it a full quasi-period, you shift it a full period, what is going to happen to the pulson? It's going to shift and then it's going to map again onto itself, but not precisely because now the tone will appear with a phase shift and that's the quasi-periodicity. So what happens when you take a pulson and you shift it in time, a complete period, you get a pulson times a phase shift. And that's a quasi-periodicity uh, in delay. Okay? So you have a concrete interpretation of quasi-periodicity. So these are the coordinates, but uh, also you have the physical width, and they have an uh, interpretation in time. So uh, the width of the pulse in delay turns out to be inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the pulsar. So as you make the pulse more and more narrow in delay, you extend the band, the bandwidth of the pulsar. Okay, so the width of the pulse in delay is basically the width of each pulse in time. Okay, if you make this pulse as narrower and narrower, it means extending the bandwidth. And reciprocally, the width of the pulse, the delay Doppler pulse in Doppler, is inversely proportional to the duration of the pulsar. So if you make the pulse narrower and narrower in Doppler, it means that you are extending the duration in time of the pulsar. Okay? Putting it differently, if you, in order to, to gain higher and higher resolution in delay, you need to extend the bandwidth. In order to gain higher and higher resolution in Doppler, you need to extend the duration, the observation time. And this is something which is very, which is, based, which is a fundamental principle in radar theory, 
And this theory of the pulsons and quasi-periodic paths, this mathematical theory just explain this understanding in a, in a, in a rigorous manner, in a, very, in a seamless rigorous manner, okay? So locality in delayed Doppler correspond to extended bandwidth and duration in traditional time and frequency. Uh, any questions so far before I move on? Oh, yes, uh, Shania? Uh, yeah, I have received several questions, but uh, I'm... So let's answer, okay, if there are and I will answer them again. Uh, okay. Ah. So the, uh, uh, no, we, we can do it later, of course. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's finish keep going. and then we can discuss. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Sure. Okay. No, I, I just wanted to know if anything I just said is uh, make sense. That, yeah, that of course. I think the questions about. are not too related to what you are talking about at the moment. So I think it's right. very good. Yeah. So, so yeah. Okay. We can continue. Okay. Sure. So, all right. So now we understand that uh, once you understand that, that's it, you understand OTFS. Once you understand what I said so far, you understand OTFS in the same sense that you understand OSDM. Uh, OTFS is just a pulse in delayed Doppler, quasi-periodic pulse, I uh, remember that. But uh, it's a quasi-periodic pulse in delayed Doppler. So for example, if you want to send an OTFS packet, you place a grid in the delayed Doppler uh, domain, in this delayed Doppler box, and you position a, a, a quasi-periodic pulse on each of these grid points and you decorate it by a quant symbol. The same way you do with OFDM, you, you put a cascade of pulses in frequency and each pulse is decorated by a quant. So that's what you have in, in, in OTFS and then you transmit this configuration using the ZAC transform. That's it. Uh, a little bit of numerology just to make things even more concrete, to show you that we don't violate the Nyquist rate and everything. Everything is left intact, so we are not violating any any holy principle here. So here are typical typical numbers, which in fact correspond to LTE numerology. So a typical delay period, tau p here, is 50 microseconds. Okay. A, a typical Doppler period, nu p, is 20 kilohertz. Notice the 20 kilohertz times 50 microseconds is equal one. I told you the area of the box is equal one. Okay, a typical uh, delay resolution, which is the width of the pulse in delay, is 100 nanoseconds. Okay, 100 nanoseconds. This means that the bandwidth of the pulson is one over 100 nanoseconds, which is 10 megahertz. And overall, you have 500 points along the delay period. One is 50 microseconds divided by 100 nanoseconds is 500. Okay? A, a typical Doppler uh, resolution, the width of the pulse in Doppler is one kilohertz. And this translates to a duration T of one over one kilohertz, which is one millisecond. And overall, you have 20 points. You can, you can, you can, you can put 20 pulses along Doppler without them touching each other. Orthogonal. Okay, so, so overall, you can transmit an orthogonal configuration of quasi periodic pulses consisting of 10,000 pulses, 500 times 20. Okay, in a bandwidth of 10 megahertz and duration of one millisecond. And that's exactly the night we see. Okay, so, so I hope that you can see that uh, the, the Nyquist rate is still valid also in the delayed Doppler uh, signal processing uh, reality. Uh, but it have a different interpretation, that's all. Uh, but still, you cannot put more than the Nyquist rate of orthogonal signals inside a specific band and specific duration. Okay, so in a bandwidth of 10 megahertz and duration of one millisecond, I can transmit 10,000 uh, orthogonal quasi-periodic pulses as the Nyquist rate dictates. Okay, so it's not that there is certain magic here and I can, I can violate some fundamental principle of signal processing. No, I'm just doing signal processing in a different uh, class of signals. All right, so let's recap and just gain a little bit of a broader perspective about what we, we said so far. 
Uh, if I have to teach signal processing uh, in the new century, this is the way I'm going to teach it. Uh, I will draw a triangle and I will tell the students that there are three basic signal, uh, three basic signal domains or signal representation. There is the classical time representation, the classical frequency representation, and they are related by Fourier transform. And there is the slightly less uh, classical delay Doppler representation, where signals are quasi-periodic functions on the delay Doppler domain. And there are transforms relating or equivalenting between each of these two represent each of these representations. So there is the Fourier transform between time and frequency, and there are these ZAC transforms between delay Doppler and time and delay Doppler and frequency. One is called time ZAC and the other is called the frequency ZAC. And the ZAC transforms are not exactly what I just wrote here, but roughly speaking, they are just projections. If you want to take a delay Doppler signal and, 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 and convert it into a time signal, you just need to integrate it along the Doppler period and reciprocally to convert it into a frequency signal. And these are all equivalents, okay? So the unitary equivalences. So, so and, and the nice thing, by the way, about this uh, triangle is mathemat mathematicians like to say it is commutative in the sense that it doesn't matter how you move along the circumference of the triangle, you get the same result. Uh, in particular, you can go from frequency to time using the Fourier transform, or you can go from frequency to time in the longer route by first applying uh, ZF inverse and then applying ZT. So, so and the claim is that you are going to get the same thing. So in fact, the Fourier transform can be decomposed into a multiplication of the two Zach transforms. <laughs> All right, so that's an interesting result. And turns out that this result has meaning. It's an interesting result in mathematics and engineering. Uh, this decomposition of the Fourier transform means that you have two different algorithms to compute the Fourier transform. One is just computing the Fourier transform. And the other is computing first the, the ZAC transform F and then the ZAC transform T and composing them. And can you guess what is the second algorithm? The second algorithm has a name. When you compute the Fourier transform with composition of two ZAC transforms, what you get is an algorithm which is well known in the literature. It's called the Cooley Tukey fast Fourier transform algorithm. So the fast Fourier transform algorithm is conceptually just calculating the Fourier transform by means of the two Zach transform. So every time you are applying FFT, without knowing, you are moving through this quasi-periodic land of the delay Doppler domain. Uh, you don't know that you do it, but you do. Uh, you just, you know, there is all this butterfly and all these things. What you're actually doing is instead of going from frequency to time, you go from frequency to the quasi-periodic land of delay Doppler and then from this land to to time, that's what you're doing. And turns out that in the diagram, this, this route looks longer, but in terms of computation, it's shorter. <laughs> so computing the ZAC and then the other ZAC is take less computation than computing the Fourier transform. Uh, anyhow, I think it's peculiar. So this is just to convince you that this delay Doppler quasi-periodic world is very meaningful. It, it was there all from the beginning. It was already there every time you are doing an FFT. Okay, so if you look at this face of the diagram, this is OFDM, the Fourier transform. In OFDM, you place the information uh, along a frequency and you modulate it using the Fourier transform. And this face of the diagram is OTFS. You place the information in, in delay Doppler and you modulate it using the VAC transform, okay? Um, so now let me bring, let me connect everything together and bring the channel into, the, into consideration. So, and hopefully now everything will click. And uh, so let's say we have collection of reflectors. In this case, five reflectors. Some are moving, some are static. You see three static reflectors, a house, a building, and a tower. The tower sits at zero, zero. My zero, zero is shifted a little bit. And so that's the origin. And you have two moving reflectors, which have a non-zero Doppler. And I, I apologize, I'm not showing you the gain of the reflectors, I'm only showing you the delay Doppler characteristic. And I want to understand how these reflectors interact with the pulson. But to appreciate that, first let me explain how it interacts with the pulse in time, with the TDMA and with the OFDM. This is something that you already understand, 
and then you will contrast it with OTFA. So let's say that I transmit a TDMA path through this environment. So it's going to propagate, interact with each of the reflectors, and what I'm going to get on the receive side is a configuration of echoes displaced in time according to the delay characteristics of the reflector. Now I want you to focus attention on the second echo. The second echo is in fact a superposition of two reflections which have the same delay but different Doppler. Now because the TDMA path is not localized in frequency, it cannot separate between these reflectors. And these two reflectors are going to superimpose on one another. So the second echo is a superposition of two reflections which are not separated. Sometimes this superposition is constructive, sometimes this superposition is destructive. And as a result, the second echo is going to fluctuate in energy as you move along time. And this is called time selective fading. This is time selectivity, okay? So time selectivity is caused by the non-locality, by, non by the inability to separate reflectors along Doppler, okay? And reciprocally, the same thing happened with OFDM. If you send the pulse in frequency, it is not localized in time. So you cannot separate reflector which have the same Doppler but different delays. And as a result, you will get this destructive constructive superposition. And the middle echo in this case is going to fluctuate in energy. And this is the, what is called frequency selective. And so the main takeaway is that the phenomena of fading, either time selective or frequency selective, is not, and I repeat, it's not an intrinsic property of the channel. The channel is just a collection of reflectors. The channel doesn't fade. Fading, or this fluctuation in energy, is an attribute of the interaction of the channel with a specific waveform. In particular, time selective fading is a result of the waveform not being local in frequency. And frequency selective fading is a consequence of the waveform being non-localized non in time. So you cannot separate reflections along delay. Okay, that's a very important uh, insight. Uh, fading, the channel doesn't fade. The channel is a static object. What fades is the pattern of the interaction of the channel with a specific waveform and the mechanism behind fading is this non-locality. So now look what happened in OTFS. So in OTFS you are transmitting a pulson, and here you see the five reflections. Now, what does it mean to transmit a pulson? It means that you are transmitting a, a quasi-periodic pulse in delayed op. You apply the Zach transform, you get a pulson, the pulson interact with the reflector, and then on the receive side you apply the inverse Zach transform. And the question is, what do you get? And the answer is that you get that. You get a configuration of five echoes in delay Doppler, which are displaced according to the delay Doppler characteristics of, a, of the reflection. Okay, in particular, if the pulse is localized enough, all the echoes now are separated. So nothing adds up destructively or constructively. And the phenomenon of fading is to a large extent mitigated. And if you apply the right receiver, which coherently assembles the energy, you, you mitigated to a large extent the phenomenon of fading. In particular, from this picture you see that the pulson behave exactly as it should, as, as if it is truly localized both in time and in frequency. It actually separates the echo, no matter what, because it is localized both in time and in frequency. In this sense, that's, this slide tells you the formal meaning of in what sense the pulson is localized in time and in frequency the way it interacts with the reflector. And the main takeaway is that everything is separated now and can be coherently combined. And in this way, you get a very stable energy on the symbol level, okay? Uh, and in addition, now you see the connection to radar field because the, the pattern of the interaction of the pulson with the reflection, reflector, what it gives you, what you are going to measure in the delay Doppler domain is the delay Doppler characteristic of the channel. That's a delay Doppler radar image of the channel. A pulson behaves as a kind of a ideal a radar waveform. It senses the environment in terms of its delay Doppler characteristic. So you can use a pulson 
to do state of the art delay Doppler radar. Okay? So, so and, and that's exactly what you see in this picture. Okay, again, recapping, you have three basic uh, modulation techniques. You have TDMA, which carry information over pulses which are localized in time. You have OFDM, which carry information over pulses which are localized in frequency. And then you have the missing link so far, or the, I would call it the mother modulation, the universal modulation, which carry information over two-dimensional quasi-periodic pulses in delay drop. Uh, so there are three basic uh, approaches now. Uh, but in fact, the good news are there is this only a one approach and that's OTFS. You don't need to remember TDMA and OFDM because in fact, these two modulation techniques are limiting cases of OTFS. And what do I mean by that? Remember that when you define OTFS, you need to define the delay Doppler box. And you are free to choose the period any way you want. Okay? So in particular, you can take uh, the delay period to infinity and what is going to happen is that the Doppler period will uh, squeeze to zero. And in the limit, what you're going to get is just a, a line. The box will become a line, and this is in fact the time domain, and OTFS will become TDMA. And on the other limit, what happens is that you extend the Doppler period to infinity, and you compress the delay period to zero, and you will get a vertical line, which coincides with the frequency line, and OTFS will become OFDM. You can see that from the picture of the pulson. When you extend the delay period, what happens is that you are separating the pulses from one another further and further. So in the limit, what is going to happen is that the tone structure disappears and you are left with a single pulse, that's TDMA. And in the other limit, what happens is that you compress the pulses against one another so that in the limit, the pulse structure disappears and you are left with a continuous tone which is OFDM. So I think it's interesting to realize that OFDM and TDMA are the two corner cases of a continuous family of modulation techniques which interpolate between them. And, and, and you can strike the balance uh, according to your different applications, where you, what kind of box you want to choose for any particular application. Although if you choose the box in the middle, 50 microseconds and, and 20 kilohertz period, this box will, will fit most of the pedestrian, terrestrial application. It's like, it's not sensitive to that. Okay, very quickly, let me talk a little bit about, about performance. I'm not going to dwell too much about it right now. Just I want to remind you, what happened when you make the pulson narrow enough, localized enough, it means that the reflectors are separated. Once you reach a critical resolution, the reflectors do not interact with one another anymore and you extract the full diversity of the channel. So you get a very stable SNR and that's what you see in this graph. So there is a critical resolution that once you achieve it, boom, everything freeze, everything hardens. It's a hardening effect and, and that's it. No fluctuations anymore. Okay, but of course in reality you don't achieve this resolution because you have some bandwidth uh, limitation and, and latency limitation, but that's a theoretical result. But I think more intriguing is the fact that if you treat OTFS as, as, as in the exact domain and, and, and you do everything right, um, there, all the phenomena of intercarrier interference and all of that disappear and the performance of OTFS is oblivious to the velocity. You can drive in any velocity, 500 miles per hour, one Mach, doesn't matter, you will get the same, the, the same performance. It's completely insensitive to performance. Uh, but in order to see that, you need to understand the structure of twisted convolution and the fact that the interaction of the channel with the symbols in the delay Doppler domain is not a convolute two-dimensional convolution interaction, but what is called twisted convolution interaction. But once you understand that, it's completely analytic and you can equalize it and people are doing that. And then you get a performance which is completely stable no matter what the velocity is. And, and I think this is the most appealing property of OTFS discovered so, uh, discussed so far. Finally, OTFS is a very flexible uh, framework and you can adjust the PAPR. In particular, you can get versions of OTFS which have PAPR which is compiled, comparable to single carrier modulation while extracting the full diversity of the channel 
and in this case you can extend uh, the link budget. Um, let me just summarize, this is my last slide. The main advantages, partial list, again, just from a bird view I, resilience to delayed offer spread, you don't require cyclic prefix, OTFS does not require cyclic prefix, so all the cyclic prefix already disappears, you don't need it, you only need a small guard band in the beginning of the frame, but in terms of the capacity overhead it is negligible, so think about it, you're talking about very high velocity, very high delay spread, and still you don't need cyclic prefix, uh, and you get efficient equalization and, and, and everything, uh, it's, it's, it's it becomes the benefits compound here. Uh, no intercarrier interference. Again, when you get to high velocity, it has a pronounced uh, deterioration effect. You extract the diversity, you get efficient pilot structure. Again, because of the locality of the channel interaction in the delayed upper domain, you don't need to sacrifice a lot of resources in order to acquire the channel. There is a lot of work about this uh, in the literature today. OTFS is also a spread spectrum. I didn't talk too much about it but there is a spread attribute to OTFS, which can be discussed at length, and this allows you to trade bitrate with processing gain, and also leads to security communication. Uh, you can transmit below the noise and, and get link budgets of 40 dB gain and 50 dB link budget gain. Uh, it's very, it has all, it preserves all the attributes of CDMA. You can actually imitate CDMA in almost every attribute while keeping the OTFS structure intact. And also, I hope I was able to convey to you it's a joint communication radar sensing because the OTFS pulls on at the same time carries information in the delayed Doppler domain and can be equivalent, efficiently equalized and, and processed. But at the same time of being that, it is a radar waveform. It's, it gives you the delayed Doppler radar image of the environment. Okay, and uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Ronnie, for your wonderful talk. So I think there are quite a few questions. So Shangyang, please uh, check if you have any time to for these questions. Because uh, I think I, I exhausted my hour, but uh, oh, yeah. keep in mind. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. I think um, given the time, I think we, we probably can ask like a three questions. Uh, I have actually received quite a lot of questions for this exciting speech. First of all, the first one is actually from Ya Ru Shan. I'm not sure like if you are able to talk in person, uh, please let me know. I think you can unmute yourself and speak. If not, I'll repeat your questions. You just repeat this question because I can hear you very well. Oh yeah, okay. So, uh, so Ya Ru has mentioned how to do channel prediction in the delay Doppler domain and uh, the different data frame, data frames, especially for the continuous Doppler spread. Okay, so when you do, um, so it's, it, this, this is a big question uh, yeah. and I cannot give, this is a big question and it's a good question. And there are, there are a lot of, there are quite numerous works in the literature today doing this in various ways. So I can give you just the principle and, and, and really the principle is the following that first of all, when you do OTFS, uh, you don't predict. In traditional use of OTFS, you put a pilot in the delay Doppler domain and you acquire the channel for every frame. You acquire the channel for every frame and inside this frame, the channel that you acquired will apply uh, to all the symbols in the right. frame. Right. So you don't need to predict inside the frame. And the frame, and, and, and this is very important to understand, the frame, can be one, 100 megahertz band and one second duration. It can be a huge frame and the frame can consist trillions of signals, but still you will acquire one small channel inside this frame. And once you acquire it, you can apply it stationary, in a stationary manner, you can apply it to all the symbols in the frame. But, so no prediction inside the frame, just understanding that you acquire, you, you devote certain portion of the frame for acquisition. And then if you understand quasi periodicity or twisted convolution, you can equalize, you can use it in order to equalize every symbol. Uh, if you want to predict among frame, so I think I said it in the beginning, uh, the only non-predictable aspect of the delay Doppler channel model is the phase. So remember you have delay characteristic, you have Doppler characteristic, you have propagation law, and then you have a phase. The phase is the only thing which is rapidly changing. All the rest of the parameters are to a large extent uh, predictable and uh, static. 
So, so really what the, 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 all the prediction techniques are in a sense identifying the delay Doppler characteristics of the reflector and their propagation loss, and their propagation loss, and then focusing on the phases. Right. Predicting them, and again, the, the phases the phases now are not superimposed, they are separated from one another, and they, and you can predict them to some extent. Uh, of course, nothing is perfect here, but much better than what you can do. At least you have some physical, inter you have the, the correct physical, uh, uh, inter you have the, the correct physical decomposition, which right. can lead Makes to sense. predictability. Uh, if you try to predict the channel as it is, as a kind of a complex number in the time frequency domain, it is, it is, it is hopeless. It, this complex number, the superposition of many reflections, it can behave completely erratically and it's very difficult to predict it. The yes. only way to predict it is to decompose it into the constituent reflectors and predict the, each reflector separately, yes. not predicting the, the, the superposition. That's the main insight. And then you can go and dive deeper and look at the literature and people are doing uh, interesting work in this, in this direction. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Uh, here's another question from Omid Abbasi. Uh, he has mentioned two very good questions. Uh, and, and I think this one is actually particularly related to what you responded just, just now. He mentioned in some early papers from Jason and Botsky's papers, they have mentioned that using drug transform to show oh, the yeah. signal in the Doppler domain to, uh, but they are, they, I think what he means is like, uh, he thinks the signal in quasi period only being quasi periodic in delay axis and uh, pure per periodic. That's, in Doppler. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's you the question. You know. to, okay. This is a very good question. This is yes. a very, very good question. So, and, and in fact, there are two questions here. First of okay. all, there is a remark that the signal is quasi periodic only in delay and periodic in Doppler. And then right. there is the, the other aspect uh, remark is that how this discussion that we made about OTFS related to the classical work on the vector yes. form in the context of filter bars. Yes. Okay, this is classical work. It's go beyond Jensen, it's, it's Gabor. Um, so I will explain, I will answer these two questions because, okay. um, so the first question, um, the first, sorry, I'm a bit tired, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. The first question is about what? Remind me? Uh, it's about like a being quasi periodic in yeah, delay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So this, uh, that's a convention. Uh, look, um, you can, it's, it's a matter of a mathematical convention that right. you can actually get rid of quasi periodicity along one of the dimensions. You can, you can yeah, tweak the coordinates or you can tweak the formula. It's called, it's, it's all related to all kinds of homotetics of the Eisenberg group. Not important. But you can actually kind of, it's like you can always rotate something so that this will align with the origin. So you can make one of the periods periodic, but the other will be quasi-periodic. So you cannot get rid of quasi-periodicity altogether. You can get rid of it only along one of the dimensions. I would in fact say that you don't want to do that. Uh, the, the canonical convention will have quasi-periodicity along both dimensions. Uh, and again, this is a mathematical uh, thing, but the correct, the correct uh, convention is the one which is symmetric. It's quasi periodic along both. Uh, but if it's more convenient for whatever reason to get rid of quasi periodicity along one of them, you can do that, and you don't set any any generality. Um, and and you know, but 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 it won't. You won't gain anything fundamental. It's 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 a. Uh, it's nothing, it's, it's really, and regarding the other thing is the Zach transform uh, was invented, was created, not invented, it was revealed many, many years ago. It is used all over mathematics and it is used also in signal processing, but it, it is not used in the manner that it is used in OTFS and I will explain. When you are creating filter banks, uh, one of the, the Zach transform is used to create filter banks. And what do I mean by that? The filter bank can be, is, is a fundamental signal that uh, can be identified in the delay Doppler domain. But uh, if, you, if you look at these signals, that, uh, these generators, these generators of filter banks, and you view them in the delay Doppler domain, what you see is that you get signals in the delay Doppler domain which are completely spread. 
<laughs> and they have absolute value one. They are like two dimensional window, which, yep. which cover the whole delayed Doppler box. So these, these are called bi-orthogonal uh, generators. So this bi-orthogonality condition translates to being a signal in the delayed Doppler domain, which is completely smeared and have absolute value one. That's filter bank theorem. Uh, okay. While the OTFF uh, carrier is completely the opposite. It's a mm. signal in the delayed Doppler domain which is localized. Right. <laughs> so, so in a sense, bi-orthogonal uh, 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 orthogonal generator, which are used in, uh, in, in filter bank OFDM and all of that, are the complete opposite <laughs> of the OTFS carrier. Yes. And, and, and this is, I think, interesting to understand. So, uh, and, 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 but, but more than that, when you're doing filter bank, you're not really doing, you're only creating the signal in the delay Doppler. You, you, you can use the delay Doppler domain to create the carrier, but you are not using the delay Doppler domain to do filtering, to do equalization. You are not doing communication in the delay Doppler domain. Yes. You are just using the delay Doppler domain to create a certain signal, and then you use it using whatever. And you forget about the delay of the most people don't even know that bi orthogonal signals can be interpreted in the delay Doppler domain. Mm -hmm. So, but in OTFF, the delay Doppler domain is present as the, as the same way that frequency is present in OFDM. You cannot do OFDM without understanding frequency through and through and through. You cannot do OTFS without understanding delay Doppler and quasi periodicity through and through and through and through. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for a good answer. Uh, I, there's only one last question, I think, we, given the time so far. So it's from Amit Bura. He has mentioned that, could you please elaborate on how Cooley Tukey FFT algorithm is equivalent to indirect performing such transform operations together? I cannot. Uh, you know, I, I can just <laughs> tell you the fact. Okay. That, uh, because this, that's, that's, that's a technical question. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you a mathematical fact, and I can in fact direct you to papers. Uh, I think I've seen this fact somewhere. Uh, I can find uh, it's, it's an old paper uh, okay. of, of somebody which is. Uh, um, there are some some interesting guys. Anyhow, it's a classical. It's it's. I'm, I'm not sure it's a well-known paper, but uh, that's the statement is that the fast the FFT algorithm. Is, uh, is literally the Zach decomposition of the Fourier bank. I see. And, and if, you, if, if you would want to teach what the FFT is to a mathematician, it won't help you to just tell him about the butterfly. You won't be able to understand what you're saying. But if you tell a mathematician you, it's the factorization of the Fourier transform to, to Zach transform, it will be completely clear to him. Okay, so that's what the, the FFT is. Uh, it's slightly more uh, subtle than that, because in fact, it's not, first of all, the FFT algorithm is not in the continuous. So mm. everything I discussed so far is in the, in the continuous realm and the FFT is in the discrete realm. But everything I told you about the ZAC, about quasi-periodicity can be extended to discrete signal processing. Mm. So you can have the discrete time, the discrete frequency, the discrete delay Doppler and the discrete ZAC transform. And the mm. statement is that the discrete Fourier transform the finite Fourier transform is the is the it can be factorized into composition of the two discrete Zach that, that's the FFT. I see. Thank you for your good answer. Um, I think that should be all because we, we also have some other questions. I think maybe we can save those questions in the panel discussion section. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you for your good okay. answer. Speech. I think I stopped sharing, did I? I think I that's oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Ronnie. So uh, let's welcome Emmanuel for the second invited talk. Uh, so the second invited talk will be the OTFS detect detection and channel summation, a low complexity practical solution, which will be provided by Professor Emmanuel Viterbo from Monash University. Uh, so let me have a brief introduction of Emmanuel. Emmanuel Viterbo receives the PhD degree in the electrical engineering from the Polytechnic of Turin, Italy in 1995. He is currently a professor with the ECSE department and associate dean of 
graduate research with Monash University Australia. Uh, he has been an ISI highly cited researcher since 2009. His main research interests include the lattice codes and the outbreak coding theory, the digital terrestrial television broadcasting, uh, digital magnetic recording, and the irregular sampling. He is an associated editor of the i 4 transactions on information theory, and he is also a guest editor of the i 4 JSTSP. Uh, so let's have a warm welcome for Professor Emmanuel Viterbo for his market talk. Uh, so okay. Emmanuel, I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, share my slides. I hope you'll see them now. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And uh, it's always a pleasure to give the talk after Ronnie, because he sets all the background, and so I can tell you some more practical uh, uh, top, discuss some more practical topics that are uh, certainly very interesting for uh, people developing applications. Um, the so I this uh, this talk was uh, uh, the result of our work, and I would like to thank Taraj, Raviteja, and E. Uh, for uh, developing many of the topics in, in, in that I discuss here. In particular, we will see the plan for the talk is, uh, well, just to touch again, based on a few concepts about the delayed Doppler communication and the, this uh, concept that the channel can be visualized uh, in the delay Doppler plane simply by its, uh, the, each path is, uh, is, uh, is one uh, bump in the delayed Doppler plane. And uh, you can see in the picture here, the transmitter is, uh, and the receiver is the gray car. So the, um, the, uh, the, the corresponding paths have different uh, intensity and that's the size of the circles in the delay Doppler plane. And then the, um, the fact that every, these, these, scat these scatters are moving uh, gives us a different Doppler shift, uh, depending on the speed of each of the scatters. And this, uh, now it's one important concept that is that this uh, captures a scene uh, instantaneously, or let's say, uh, for the time you, you take a picture of the scene, uh, you get this, this channel. But if you take a picture, let's say a few seconds, maybe a fraction of a second later, maybe one second later, you see the cars have moved. So in that situation, the, the, the channel has changed, okay? So the delay Doppler channel has changed, but the scale at, this, at which this change happens is much, much slower than, uh, than uh, um, what would happen if we were looking at the channel in time and frequency. So I think Ronnie explained this concept uh, already, but look, I, I like to visualize it in, in these two pictures. Uh, so the good news is that we can embed pilot and estimate the channel at the same time within each frame. So we, we have the, a current frame uh, est channel estimation for that frame, and then we can uh, we can use it to do the detection. So the um, the the real differentiator of OTFS is that um, the information symbols are placed in this delay Doppler domain. Now that's that's uh, an abstract domain. We will see, but the um, the, it's a good domain because it's where the channel is, uh, has the least uh, number of parameters. It can be described in the sparsest possible way because once you know the, the scatters where they are and the, the, the delay between uh, transmitter and receiver uh, across each path and the speed of the scatters, you, you know uh, and enough about the channel to use uh, this delay Doppler communication. So the plan for, for today is uh, the following. Let me just clean one thing, uh, clear all the drawings. Okay, um, 
So we'll just see a few general uh, concepts about delayed Doppler time frequency and, and time domains. I'll go a bit faster on that. Okay, <laughs> I need to clean that. Um, and then um, we'll just see a bit of the, the uh, difference between uh, this ideal uh, pulse shapes versus rectangular pulse shapes that was in the first version, uh, was discussed in the first way, was the, the first uh, um, way the OTFS was presented. Um, and then we will go into the representation, the input output relation using the, the discrete ZAC transform, which is this, uh, is just a discrete version of the ZAC transform discussed by Ronnie. And uh, we'll show that in, in the, the, using the discrete ZAC transform, it's quite natural to see how the system works. And we can see parallels with uh, what happens when you're using OFDM, time and uh, signals in time, and then the corresponding in frequency. Here we, we, in, uh, in OTFS, based on the discrete ZAC transform, we will see signals in times, which are the pulse zones that Ronnie uh, illustrated. And then the corresponding, uh, the, instead of the frequency domain, we're going to use the delay Doppler, which is now it's a two-dimensional domain. So it's not just 1D, but it's a 2D. And in OFDM, we are used to visualize uh, the, the spectrum as uh, many sync pulses. Uh, these, these sync pulses are all orthogonal. Now, the, the magic thing is that in the delay Doppler domain, these are these pulses look like the look like these uh, sync pulses, but they are two dimensional. I'll show you some pictures of that. And so you can kind of relate to 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 the delay Doppler domain as a two dimensional uh, transform domain where where uh, things look just look similar to what you're doing in in uh, OFDM. But the, the other thing I wanted to spend a few words about is uh, the different variants of, of OFDM, of, of OTFS. So we've, we've talked about, uh, um, I mean, the, the basic version is the one where we don't need any um, cyclic prefix uh, or, uh, or zero padding. Uh, but there are other versions where we can we can insert uh, CP and ZP uh, in different places. So we'll we'll just go through the different types, and there are pros and cons of, of each one of them. So we'll discuss a bit of that. And then the 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 next thing is the low complexity iterative detector, which is this uh, maximum ratio based on the iterative maximum ratio combining decision feedback equalization, which is naturally coming from the, 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 the interpretation of the OTFS in using the discrete ZAC transform. So the, the, um, the good thing is that the, when we look at things in, uh, in this, the, the, there is another domain we are particularly interested in, is uh, is just the delay time domain. Uh, and the delay time domain is, is halfway between the delay Doppler and the time domain. It's just uh, still in a two dimensional plane. And there, when we write the input output relation, uh, the, the matrix relating input and output in delay time domain turns out to be sparse, uh, more sparse than, than what it is in the delay Doppler domain. And that makes uh, the equalizer uh, complexity lower than, than if we did equalization fully in the delay Doppler domain. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the the uh, final, well, the, the, say the conclusion is that of comparing different, uh, the different variants and the different uh, type of, of uh, detectors, well, we, we kind of came up with our conclusion that inserting the ZP between each block uh, provides the lowest complexity on the detection. And, um, and in, in conjunction with the fact that we also need to insert pilots uh, into the, into the, um, into the uh, transmitted frames to, to estimate the channel, 
when, when you consider that you have to insert pilot, there is an overhead to insert the pilots. And that overhead uh, is equivalent to just inserting uh, zero padding in each of the blocks. So I'll show you exactly that, what I mean about that. So you can find the, uh, the MATLAB code of, of most of the things I will talk about today uh, in, on our website on OTFS. And uh, then you can, um, you can download it and, and try uh, th how, how things work. And sometimes it's easier to, to read the MATLAB code if you, if you get lost in the equations, okay? So I'm happy if you try. And then as, uh, uh, sorry, got stuck. Try to press with the mouse on the page. It happened to me also as well. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, so then coming soon, it's uh, so early next year. We'll have uh, um, we've written well during lockdown. We 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 were busy writing up this uh, all what we learned about the about delayed Doppler communications from OTFS and uh, uh, it should be soon in next year, you, you may uh, see our book appear. So we are still uh, waiting for some uh, corrections. Okay, so I will, many things are, I will mention are, are going to be in, in that book. So the, the um, let's go back to the original OTFS modulation uh, how it was first presented in, in uh, 2017. Um, that's the first time I, I, I heard the, uh, the presentation myself. So I was very excited and I, I thought it was worth uh, looking at and trying to understand what was going on. And it's, it was really interesting uh, experience. The, the um, well, the, the basic, uh, the way it was presented was in stages, right? So because, because the delayed Doppler uh, domain was not so familiar at that time, it was actually a great idea to, to rely on the time frequency domain as uh, the intermediate place where people know what, what uh, signals look like, okay? So the, the idea was to think of the delayed Doppler, the, um, of the time frequency in, in uh, signals in time frequency plane, and then pre-code in uh, uh, by this uh, two-dimensional transformation uh, into a, this delayed Doppler domain, which is uh, also two-dimensional. And then uh, we know how to transfer from time frequency plane into time domain, and that's a typical uh, OFDM modulator does that. So you go you go from two D in delayed Doppler to two D in uh, frequency time, and then you put that all together and you, you, you go into a pure time domain. The time domain signal goes through the physical channel and it gets received. Well, there you have that like uh, the conversion from time to time frequency, and then you do the inverse um, of the precoding operation, which was this uh, SFFT, the symplectic transform to go back to the delay Doppler domain. So here are just the, the equations of these blocks, but what, what I want you to look at uh, about them is, is the fact that we are going from two dimensional samples. If, if you are, I don't know if you, do you see my cursor uh, moving or? or uh, yes. You see it, okay, so good. Okay, so what will you see here that I'm taking the samples in time frequency and then uh, there is a double sum, I'm adding them all up. Uh, each sample is uh, multiplying a, a transmitted pulse, uh, GTX, uh, which is shifted in time and uh, shifted in frequency. And that's what typically uh, an OFDM modulator does. And this, is, this was called the Heisenberg transform operation. The, the corresponding at the receiver, the, what we have is like a match filter, a two-dimensional match filter, which tries to match uh, the receiver, um, the, the received uh, signal R of T 
with uh, um, with a received match filter pulse, which is shifted uh, by in time and in frequency, and then you sample as, as uh, and and get the corresponding time frequency uh, samples. So ideally, we we would love to see this right that in time frequency, I, I say any samples I transmit in time frequency uh, is just scaled by by uh, a coefficient and uh, and and then uh, you receive just a scaled version of uh, a complex scaled version of what you transmitted there now this is ideal because these pulses gtx and grx are not perfectly biorthogonal and it's a consequence of the uh, the the fact that you cannot localize perfectly in time and frequency so this is let's say an ideal an ideal uh, proposition there. So this is is not true. You cannot realize it in in practice. So as uh, as Ronnie has explained, but in in reality uh, we we have a different uh, uh, interaction. And unfortunately, when you go and represent that in uh, in this domain, you you actually see that th there is not a single tap equalizer. A single tap equalization is not possible in time frequency domain. Because the the there is let's say in in the language of OFDM you you are facing intersymbol interference and intercarrier interference at the same time due to the the fact that the channel is has the delay and Doppler uh, multipath. So the the um, the um, corresponding uh, transformation the, in uh, uh, that we do to go from time frequency to delay delay Doppler is uh, is called the the inverse sorry from delay Doppler to time frequency is the inverse symplectic uh, Fourier tra Fourier transform and you see it's a two dimensional Fourier transform where the the word symplectic is because of this minus sign here so this minus sign is uh, justifies I think the the term symplectic. But uh, really, you just if you just look at it, in, you may be familiar with uh, in image processing, you do two, 2D Fourier transforms um, of, of an image. And this is what, what we are dealing with. We are dealing with two, these two-dimensional samples, sample signals, which could treat them, as, think of them as just images. Um, the, the corresponding, um, the Eisenberg transform then takes all the samples in time frequency and, uh, trans and generates the S of T. So this is just the transmitter. The, the uh, receiver we have, uh, we've said it's just the match filter and sample. And the corresponding uh, symplectic Fourier transform going from time frequency to delay Doppler is here. And you have the, the minus if I can get it there, you can see the minus. So this is the direct symplectic fast Fourier transform. And, uh, and the other one was without the minus, it was the inverse, okay? So keeping the signs the same convention as, uh, as uh, uh, DFT. So what happens is that we have these two dimensional sample signals uh, in where you have the time, time frequency samples, Y sub TF, and then you apply this two-dimensional symplectic Fourier transform to get the delay Doppler corresponding two-dimensional signals. Now, if we go to, to, uh, the, to look at the time frequency resp channel response, which is the one we are familiar with in time and frequency, where that, it, this, this can be related to the delay Doppler uh, channel response by taking the inverse symplectic fast Fourier transform, uh, final Fourier transform of the delay Doppler, which means I am uh, taking the delay Doppler channel samples and then I'm computing this uh, in ISFFT. So when you, when you look at it in, uh, in, uh, in these terms, well, Ideal pulses, it, we, we said we can do single tap equalization. So that's just uh, saying that. But what happens when uh, in time frequency, we have this single tap equalization 
it means that in the delay Doppler domain, we actually have a two dimensional convolution. This is in the case of ideal pulses because 2D uh, uh, Fourier transforms, the, the symplectic doesn't really matter, but the two dimensional Fourier transform satisfy the convolution theorem. So two dimensional circular convolution uh, in, in, let's say in uh, one domain, is uh, corresponds to uh, product in the other. So here we have the product in, uh, in the time frequency corresponds to a convolution of the channel with, uh, with the input signal X. So this is a two dimensional convolution. And then if, uh, if you visualize it down here, uh, imagine you transmit X on, in, in, in this play, this is you transmit X, this is how the delay Doppler channel looks like. As I said, there are a few paths uh, um, which are uh, critical, uh, significant. And then every, every, one, every one pulse that's transmitted in X will, be, will generate its uh, corresponding uh, Y here. So there is different, different things. Now you can imagine what happens if I put these these transmit pulses, I squash them closer together. Well, there will be uh, inter symbol interference in the delay Doppler domain. In the delay Doppler domain, so the these uh, what I have on the on this side here will be now uh, superposition of many shifted copies of this, and that's another issue with. Bio, I mean, that will make the the detection problem slightly harder, but. This is not the whole story because, uh, unfortunately, this uh, uh, this is a simple convolution, and we said that this ideal situation does not really happen in reality. So, what happens uh, when when uh, well when that does not is not possible? So, when when uh, when the ideal pulses are not thought and are not there, well, we actually we deal with finite rectangular pulses and then in that under that condition in time frequency we will be facing intercarrier interference and intersymbol interference now the the good news is that although the the convolution that circular com two dimensional convolution we had before is still there but it's twisted so what is the twist uh, the twist is simple uh you he, before we just had hi so we just have hi here now we have um, hi times uh phase shift now this is a phase shift which is is uh is time varying is changing is changing so it depends on both m and n so it's a it's a 2d convolution with these uh time varying phase rotations so that's the that's the addition, that's the twist that comes when, uh, when we are dealing with rectangular pulses. And that's what was called uh, the, the twisted convolution. Okay? Now, these, uh, these explicit phase rotations are, uh, are due to the, the, the quasi-periodic uh, structure of the signals and getting, they, they can be, quite easily derived by applying the exact transform properties. And it's, it's been beyond the, it would take a, quite a long time to explain the detail, but they, they have a, a very uh, interesting meaning in, in terms of when you look at them from the exact transform. So let's see the, um, the matrix formulation because that's maybe uh, the, the way to go to see the, how the transmitter and receiver structure uh, work. So the, the, um, let's start with the, the modulator. So what is the, the ISFFT? Okay, we said it's a two-dimensional uh, Fourier, discrete Fourier transform. So uh, these FM are the DFT matrices. So I'm taking, when I apply it to my two-dimensional signal X, if I multiply it uh, by the DFT matrix on the left, I'm going to take the Fourier transform, well, the discrete Fourier transform of each column of X. If I post multiply it on the right by uh, this other matrix F, uh, discrete Fourier transform with endpoints, uh, 
dagger, which is transpose conjugate, that is the inverse. So it's an inverse discrete Fourier transform applied to the rows of, what's, of, of, of what you have here. So you apply Fourier trans DFT to the columns and IDFT to the rows of X. And that's the 2D uh, transform, symplectic transform. And it's inverse, okay? So the, the corresponding, um, so once you've done that, you've moved, you've, you've, you've uh, mapped your delay Doppler to dimensional signal to your time frequency samples in that, in that domain. And you, you next have to go to the time domain. So that, that step is the Heisenberg transform, which we said it's just taking the, the corresponding time frequency samples applying the, an IFFT, which is what an OFDM modulator does, and then multiplying by the, the GTX pulse, which is uh, just for, for here, we'll just assume it's a, a rectangular square rate pulse. So this would just be an identity matrix. Why? So the, the final step is to, to um, stack all the, all the signal the, that we have into a single vector. So the vector, this is a 2D matrix, okay? We just apply, apply the, um, the vectorization by columns and uh, we, we get the, the time domain uh, vector, sample uh, transmitted uh, signal. Now, if you, if you see what happened, <clears throat> if, you, so if you, we had X of TF uh, and when we substitute it in here, what the, the um, one of the XN will, the, 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 the FM for a transform goes away. So when we substitute here, FM and FM dagger cancel out and uh, you just remain with this property. So you have, uh, you take the delay Doppler domain, you apply discrete Fourier transforms along the rows of X, uh, inverse, inverse discrete Fourier transform row along the rows of X, and then you vectorize, okay? So we will call this uh, X times Fn dagger, the X tilde, and that, that's, uh, that is a two-dimensional signal which lives in this uh, domain, which is the delay time domain. And once you vectorize the delay time domain, you get the, only the time domain signal S. If, <clears throat> so what is this now? So let's skip the time frequency altogether and say, um, we, we, we actually start from the delay Doppler X here. This is our delay Doppler two-dimensional signal where we will put our information uh, and directly take the vectorization of X times the, in, the inverse DFT uh, with endpoints. And that's what we call the inverse discrete ZAC transform. Okay, so the nice thing is it's a transform, it's a unitary transform. So all uh, nice properties of, uh, of um, transforms all apply. So I, I want to show you that discussion in this picture because let's say this on the right hand side here. So on this side, we had the, the, the original uh, way uh, OTFS was presented. So it's, uh, it's basically, this is the uh, um, delay Doppler. We start with the delay Doppler here. We apply the, the ISFFT, so row we Fourier, inverse Fourier of each row and the Fourier of each column of the resulting thing. We go to the time frequency here, and then <clears throat> the time frequency does the you have the Heisenberg, and you go, you get the parallel to serial. You eventually add one, one little CP at the end of the frame and then you get the time domain. So what we've shown in the matrix notation is that actually you can you will see here that you are doing, you simplify this uh, block, the, for the FFT uh, along with M points gets simplified. So you just end up with this thing on this side, which is the pure exact transform. Now, just by do, looking at this, at the transmitter 
in this simplified form, you can notice that first of all, we are doing I, just IFFT, a number of uh, IFFTs of length N. So the complexity of the transmitter, if you want, it depends on, uh, on the, on the end can be, and if N is smaller than M, you may save a bit on the complexity of the, of the transmitter and obviously as well the receiver. The other nice thing is that if you have a, a small N relative to N, M, you will have uh, even a lower PAPR. So we, we have all that spectrum of choices on M and N depending on the application, but you can see that you can uh, you can uh, uh, play with M and N to pick the sweet spot for which works for your application. Now the other thing here is that no need to put any uh, any CP on each symbol as we would do in a classic OFDM system. So we just need maybe at the end to separate frames, uh, put a CP. So that's that's the the interesting feature of the transmitter. And again, remember the game is, we go from two dimensional signals to a one dimensional signal in time by this inverse Zach transfer. What's that the receiver does, just the reverse operation. This is in the matrix form, but the, in terms of, uh, of uh, this, so at the receiver, we have a discrete Zach transform receiver. I'll go down to here directly, which takes the received time domain samples, applies this discrete Zach transform, which means you take the, the vector R, you unvectorize it, so you make it you make it back into um, into a, a two D matrix. And that's that's the delay time version of of of, uh, of the received signal. We call it y tilde, and then you apply to each row of this matrix y tilde the the endpoint DFT. So that that's the discrete Zach transform, and which means in this picture we take the received signal, we uh, remove that uh, CP or ZP anyway guard, um, and then. We stack the columns, all these, each block we'll put into the columns, and then we do the FFT along each row. And that's the received symbol. So uh, you get the received symbols here, which will uh, be just distorted versions of the transmitted ones. And the, the game is to, to then recover the, the information symbols, which were trans embedded in the delay Doppler domain. So just a, a little uh, little hint of the discrete Zach transform, the form of it, and uh, and um, possibly you you may I'm not sure, but maybe this is the way to to actually work out the relation to the Cooley Tuki uh, um, fast Fourier transform algorithm uh, with its relation with Zach. I'm not sure, but this, if you want to have a go, probably this is the way to, to try it. The answer is uh, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Great. So the, um, the, the, the game here is what is this Zach transform? Okay. So we said it goes from 2D to 1D. So we, we have our X of MK. Uh, this is mm, the delay Doppler. Uh, QAM symbols as, as, uh, as, and it's really just uh, doing the, the, um, it's a DFT, an endpoint DFT, okay, applied to each row of, of, uh, of, uh, of the matrix X, as, as we saw in the definition. And then we, what we do with that is we, we concatenate all the, all the rows but with uh, an in interleaved by, by step by n. So you, you, they are the, the resulting, because remember we wrote into columns and then we do the transforms into the row. So then, then we transmit the columns, okay? So that's the, 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 um, the correspond, there is a row column interleaving in between. So the, the similar thing at the receiver, you do the inverse operation and this is the, the uh, corresponding uh, discrete Zach transform. So in a way, if you look at this, uh, of this uh, scheme here, 
and you replace IDZT with IFFT, and you replace DZT with FFT, that's an OFDM symbol, uh, system, where we, we were going from time frequency to time through the channel and back to frequency. Here we're going from delay Doppler by this new transform, which is very different from the just the Fourier transform itself because it's going directly from 2D to 1D. Okay, that's the that's the 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 way to think of it, and I'll talk about that interpretation a bit more. Um, yeah, just maybe a quick thought about just refresher of the notion of what it, what does it mean uh, to take uh, the Fourier transform. So let's think of a signal is just a point in space, okay? And this is my this maybe some these are the samples of a, of a signal with uh, endpoints and uh, the you you represent your signal along a time basis because that's where you you can put the point in your in uh, in uh, in time every sample is one of your is one of your basis functions and then the coordinates you can place them in 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 as a point in space now what is a fourier transform is simple it's simply a change of basis we are just changing the base of uh, of uh, of this, that point in space so we are representing that point in a new coordinate system where the basis functions are the fourier basis as we said the harmonics uh, um, are the new coordinate system so that's that's one way of thinking about it and the what is frequency is the index of the of each harmonic it, it tells you uh, how you index each each function in um, in each sine wave at different frequency in uh, in the time domain but so the bases themselves are the the fourier bases are sine waves at different frequency and uh, and then you can uh, you can keep that index and use it as uh, the fourier uh, representation of the same object which is this the physical signal x which we know lives in time but we can uh, we can uh, visualize it in frequency as well equivalently no without any and the the nice feature of uh, transforms is that they when they are unitary many things work well like you have uh, the convolution property uh, parseval identity so unitary transforms are good so what's the what's the zach transform because in a way this uh, the fourier basis is nice because we have a one dimensional signal in time becomes a one dimensional signal in frequency okay so there is uh, the frequency the spectrum is uh, is a one dimensional signal which has a nice physical meaning as well and that, that's good but what what is happening in zack transform is that now we we are uh, using uh, two dimensional signals as a, as a way to represent the the, the signal x so, and these two, these, uh, these are the pulse zones that uh, Ronnie explained uh, before. And essentially they are just pulse trains, okay? This is, these are the ideal pulse trains and modulated by, by a, a complex uh, sine wave at a given frequency. So when you, you, you can think of this, these are the, basis functions in time which are parameterized by two two values the the delay tau zero and the doppler v zero these 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 are the replacement of the notion of frequency when if you if you think of the fourier transform but just think of this now these these are all mm, time domain signals and uh, you can uh, choose different tau zero v zero they will all be orthogonal. So you have a nice basis of, uh, of, uh, of signals in time, which are all orthogonal. And, and you can kind of imagine that because you, you, can, uh, you can shift, once you shift these uh, Dirac pulses, they will uh, at different, uh, with different tau zero, they will not overlap. So 
you can kind of imagine that they are orthogonal, okay? But uh, this is another, uh, just the 3D picture of the same objects. You see these are, this, train, this pulse train is actually spinning at, at a different uh, frequency determined by the, the Doppler shift V0. So that's, that's the time domain representation of, of the basis functions. Now, I told you, think in OFDM, when when we we our time domain signals are uh, sine waves okay and they, they are harmonic of, of the subcarriers they are at the frequency of each subcarrier we are super, we have a superposition of subcarriers uh, each one modulated by a different qam symbol and we transmit that uh, here we we want to see what's the what's the subcarrier uh, what does it look like in delayed Doppler domain. As much as we know that the, when we look at the spectrum of OFDM, uh, we know that you see the sync pulses, which are nicely orthogonal because each subcarriers will have a sync pulse, which does not interfere with the next one when there is no ICI. So that's the picture you, you may have in mind for OFDM. Now look what happens. What are those sync pulses look like in delayed Doppler domain. So they, they look like two-dimensional sick pulses, okay? And uh, this is just showing the magnitude, but in reality, they have all their own phases, which matter a lot. But to visualize the, the object is um, that each delayed Doppler um, slot, uh, you, you have one, one of these two-dimensional sync pulses, and then, you can obviously shift them in, uh, in, um, in, from slot to slot. They will form a nice uh, orthogonal set of two-dimensional periodic sync pulses. So that's the, that's the, the nice uh, picture I, I like to keep in mind to, to explain the, the, what's happening in the delayed Doppler domain. Okay, but... but um, then let's go back to our structure of the transmitter and see how we can use the, the fact that if you visualize the transmitter as just a, a, a inverse discrete Zach transform, things become quite simple to, to explain. Okay, so the, the, um, we, let's go back here. We have the delayed Doppler two-dimensional transmitted QAM symbols. You put them in this matrix. You take the rows, each row, I'm gonna call it X, uh, little X uh, of from zero to M minus one. So I have capital M of them. I'm doing the endpoint FFT of each row, writing it in this delay time domain. And then I'm gonna transmit the columns. So uh, what I'm transmitting is our blocks. I have uh, N blocks, each block made of M symbols. Uh, samples. Okay, so this is the transmitter and then the corresponding receiver is uh, doing the inverse operation. We take the received uh, stream, we undo, well, this has gone through the channel in which the channel we, we in, uh, in time domain, we can model that, That's an in, we input a vector and the channel uh, is uh, affecting that vector, transmitting vector S and the gen, uh, multi by a multiplication by this uh, um, channel matrix in the time domain, we get the corresponding receive vector R. So important that uh, when the operations at the receiver are just the inverse, uh, the Zach transform. And then we from here, we need to do the detection operation. So once we have the samples in delay Doppler, we've seen that the, the channel will, will produce some Mm, severe uh, interference between among all the samples. So uh, we need to recover the, the original signals, the original symbols that were transmitted by the, the detection, uh, some detection algorithm. So just to, to, again, to make another parallel with the OFDM symbols, when we talk, when we, we have a, in, time, in time frequency domain, we transmit uh, in OFDM in OFDM system, we will have multiple a number n of uh, OFDM symbols, 
and they are transmitted and we call those uh, each one of the symbols that are transmitted uh, an OFDM symbol. Now here we are going to we're going to transmit uh, delay time symbol vectors okay that and the difference here is that the in, in the, the in OFDM all the OF, one OFDM symbol is in one block. In uh, on the other hand, uh, when we are dealing with the delay Doppler um, symbols, uh, they they get scattered in time across multiple blocks. So you get this uh, row due to that row column interleaving operation. So that's uh, that's kind of important to notice because then keeping that uh, working in the delay time allows us to kind of uh, have that ordering of the vectorized ve elements, vectors, in a way that it makes the, the matrix, the channel matrix uh, very structured. And there are nice properties that can be used for detection. So this is just showing that what we transmit are still n blocks of length m, but the actual, the, the actual uh, delay time uh, symbols have to be picked jumping uh, by m and shifting by n. So the, 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 the picture of this, maybe it's easier to see it in this example. So we, we have the delay Doppler vectors. Uh, these are the rows of x, and we have just stacked stack them here. I take the endpoint IFFT, that's the, the inverse Zach transform. Uh, so in this domain, we, I mean, this is the delay time domain. They are still one after each other, but after the row column interleaver, you can see that you have to go one, one here, one here, and one here. So they get scattered across uh, the entire frame. So that's, that's, uh, um, the, the difference uh, with respect to uh, uh, what's happening in a standard OFDM system. So another another point at this at this point, then we we can uh, just uh, discuss a few variants as uh, as I was mentioning before. So, well, the let's say the 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 basic variant, the, the origin, let's say the original uh, form is probably the the case A. So the case A is uh, where we have the uh, time domain signal and we just need either a CP which we put in front, which is as long as the, um, the delay spread of the channel or a bit longer than or equal to that. Or we can also put a ZP at the end. And you know this may have, at the, at the beginning, we, we probably didn't have uh, different People studied different systems, and we just want to make them in a, in a, we try to figure out all the variants that were possible. So these were the two basic ones, and they are, let's say, the core idea can be seen here. But then there was uh, the, the other, the, what we were looking also at the, is where we insert guard either CP in each subblock in each block within a frame. So you can put it before each block, you put a CP of, uh, of, of the block, or we can put a zero pad after, after it. So zeros uh, after the samples and transmit that. Now, typically in OFDM, we add, you know, we, we, we add the, the guard, the CP is added on, so we, expand the, the duration of the frame. That's one typical way of operating. But in, uh, in, um, to make things slightly simpler to, to manage, it's actually equivalent to, to um, insert the CP or ZP by removing some samples from the transmit, re reducing the transmission rate. So the, the amount of information symbols, we shrink it and leave the space uh, to put, we put some zeros, we, say we transmit some zero information symbols in the right place. And so that the corresponding uh, ZP happens within the original length. So these are, uh, so we just named this RCP and RZP stand for reduced CP, which was the 
obviously the the initial advantage that we 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 were happy to see uh, that, that hey we are going to save all this cp and zp uh, of ofdm which is which is the second one the case b so that the c is just equivalent but the then we'll see that that's uh, actually not uh, as as advantageous as as it it, it could be because in fact we have to put in pilots and the pilots cost some uh, not some you need to put some guard symbols around the pilots to to make the channel estimation relatively simple and then when you insert that those guards you end up having an overhead which is equipped in, in if you're using the case a it is equivalent to using case b when when you are considering the pilots as well so here is the is the picture of what happens in the in the classic uh, uh, OTFS is the reduced CP case. So you can embed the pilot, but when you embed the pilot, you must make sure that the data does not leak into the pilot, uh, uh, in, uh, affecting the where the pilot is, and also the pilot must be able to uh, detect the channel. Uh, and not without any interference from the data. So you, you don't want to, you want to have a, a clean area around the pilot so that the channel can be detected uh, without, without any interference. So you, depending on how much Doppler you have, uh, you can actually have a reduced guard. You, you, have a, you have a smaller region, but if you have a, large Doppler, then you would typically need to, to use the full uh, row of, of, this, uh, of this matrix. And this is the, the delay Doppler uh, domain. Now, when you do this in, uh, with the ZP OTFS, in ZP OTFS, you actually <clears throat> make sure that the bottom row, the last row of, uh, of the transmitted symbols is, is set to zero. So you're not transmitting any information there, you're putting zeros, but then, when you put the pilot either in the reduced case, but just look at the full guard, you can see that the number of uh, guard symbols is exactly the same as above. So in a way, the, because you need the pilot, it doesn't really change. You, you lose that advantage of uh, the reduced CP. Okay, so maybe I will go more <laughs> quickly on the, on the detection. The, um, the, the, the detection we said is, is not is this twisted convolution where if you the, the important thing is when you do the detection is to know exactly what these uh, phase corrections are. If you know those phase corrections, then this becomes a, a classical detection problem where you have y equal h matrix times x and uh, plus noise. Now this um, the, the X and Y are the vectorized uh, versions of, uh, of the delay Doppler. So X, little x is the vectorized version of, uh, of X transpose. And the reason why we vectorize it this way and not vectorize X is to be compatible with the Zach transform idea, which is operating on each row. So we, what we do is, vectorize each row and then uh, let's say we are effectively vectorizing this uh, the transpose of, of x instead of just vectorizing the columns of x. Um, so that this is uh, very important because it simplifies a lot the structure of the matrix x, the, the matrix h. You know, this is the, the matrix describing the channel in the delay Doppler domain. So if that now, the good news is that this matrix is, is sparse and it only has, if you have a P paths where the number of paths is uh, uh, including paths that have the same delay and multiple Dopplers or uh, same Doppler and multiple delays, the, the, you count all the possible paths in the first picture I showed you of the cars with the cars. So that's the number of paths in, in the scene that matter. Okay, I, I need to maybe clean up a bit. Uh, okay, here, Paul. Okay, um, so the, 
when you when you look at it in this form, you know, it, it maybe remind people of the MIMO uh, problem. But the good news is that this H matrix is not a is not full matrix; it's very sparse. You know, we are talking about an n m times n m matrix, so it's a very very big matrix. If m and m are not too small, and uh, definitely much much bigger than p, which is the number of paths, as we we heard before, maybe fifteen paths will do the job. Okay, so um, the the fact that this is sparse immediately makes people think that you can use a nice message passing uh, detection algorithm, and that was. Uh, shown uh, that was the first thing we, we we tried out and it does work but it does have oh no okay uh, obviously complexity as well as much of course uh, other ways other possible solutions is going directly try to do MMSC remember this is a very big matrix but it is sparse so there are some tricks that may simplify the a bit this inversion problem taking advantage of the of the sparsity so it won't be this bad but still is not as good as uh, as what can be done in other ways the the other uh, way of attacking the detection problem is assuming that the we were we go to the the, the time frequency domain and do a single tap equalization although we know it's not accurate we just live with it and try to, uh, that's, that would be low complexity, but uh, unfortunately it, the performance degrades heavily when the, num the Doppler shifts are large and uh, that, that's, that's uh, is not really effective. The, an, another alternative uh, was also proposed is like parallel inter, inter symbol uh, cancellation. Uh, and that's also has problems with the, with the um, higher Dopplers. Now, the message passing that I mentioned before has a serious uh, issue with the, the scaling of, of the, the QAM symbol. So if, if you use it for 4 QAM, it's OK. Q is 4. But if you want a 64 QAM, it will hit hard on the complexity of the detector. And also, P is, uh, is there. So all the paths are, are important. Now there was a nice. We 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 didn't have the car to drive around, but to measure a channel. But we we had the just indoor. So what we did, we had the transmitter and the receiver. And uh, so what you see here, we transmit the pulse in delay Doppler domain, and uh, we estimated the channel. Now you see we get three pulses in uh, in with three different delays, and this is uh, just inside the room. It's uh, probably a typical uh, indoor uh, delay, delay profile. Now, what we didn't have any Doppler and we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't move things fast enough to see anything. We added that uh, artificially as uh, by emulated. So we just, uh, if you add a Doppler, you can see that the, um, each pulse actually spreads, uh, has multiple, bumps uh, along the Doppler. You see there's uh, the, the peak one, but and then you have the, the, the ones, the side lobes, which are, are also there. And as long as they stick out uh, above the noise, they will be uh, relevant and they will count as, as channel paths in, in the, the number of P. So this P, although it should be, you think it's three, it, it's actually in when you look at the discrete uh, in, in this look at the problem in discrete time, um, you actually get many more than P than, than the three because because of the, the residual side lobes there. So you this P is not that small in, in especially in the delayed in the Doppler domain because uh, yes. Um, so the, the solution to that is to um, to work in uh, in um, uh, insert the ZP and uh, and then use the the um, this uh, simple um, maximum ratio combining uh, detector. So the the as I said, the ZP doesn't hurt the overhead because we are putting in the pilots, 
and uh, the the scheme as uh, as I probably already hinted at is the ZPOTFS. We put uh, a, a set of of uh, zero symbols at the transmitter. So the zeros that are down here at the bottom will end up in as as, uh, z as zero padding in between the blocks. Okay, so that we achieve that in this form and the receive uh, the the when you do that there are some nice features happening in the the matrix relating the transmit the delay doppler transmit symbols with the received symbols so this matrix uh big matrix here actually turns out to be by inserting by putting the zeros here you put zeros you get rid of everything outside uh, outside this uh, box, so you keep. This is the good one uh, here. So we have this one. Okay. So this this uh, this now is a block. It's a block lower triangular, and each block of uh, each k block is uh, is a circular matrix, which is great because then circular matrices multiply, multiplying a circular matrix by a vector. Uh, is in fact the convolution between uh, between vectors, and then if you do convolutions in the transform domain, you you get simple products. And the transform domain from delay Doppler is the delay time. So we have those delay time sam samples available at the receiver to do that. So I, I probably don't have time to explain to you the the um, the how the MRC detector really works, but it's based on, on that, on the structure of that matrix and on the, <clears throat> on the processing over this graph, which has um, is got the, the, variable, the variable nodes are now vectors of uh, OTFS symbol vectors. Um, so rows of the X matrix. These are our variable nodes that we want to estimate. The, the, the QAM symbols, there are, uh, vectors of QAM symbols, each one. And then the branches describe which matrices affect those uh, symbols. And what does that do? It spreads the, um, the transmitted symbols across multiple received symbol vectors. Why? So these are the observation nodes, the blue ones. Now, the MRC, this maximum ratio combining, what it does, it tries to Pack to collect from each one of the receive of the received symbol vectors, the where there is some information about x zero, we combine them by a maximum ratio combining, and we get a good estimate for for that x zero. Once we have that good estimate, we subtract it. So that's successive cancellation is decision feedback uh, cancellation, and we can move on to the next one. Now you can do it once, and then you can iterate multiple times. So the, the advantage of this, I'll just highlight it here, is that now the complexity reduces to NML, and L is just the number of delays. So it doesn't matter what happens to the Dopplers, which often can take up all the N samples because of the fractional Doppler effect. Uh, this is probably the lowest possible complexity because uh, you still need to process, you pro, you're processing the Doppler as vectors, and you don't need to, to dig into uh, the, all the P paths, uh, paths. You just need to know the delays paths. So that's, that's a, the big advantage of that. And um, so I'll skip that. Some, Of course, it, you can iterate a number of times to improve, and you can improve convergence on all that. P performance wise, it performs as well and, and with 444 QAM even better than, than the message passing, but uh, essentially as well as the message passing and obviously much better than, than an OFPM. Uh, the, you can do um, turbo. So you put a, you add a uh, code uh, and then you just do one iteration of MRC. So ju just one pass and then you, you apply the, you decode you re-encode and you, you do it again. This uh, is, has very, very good performance. It improved, you know, you can get a 64 QAM uh, working pretty well. 
and then uh, compared to uh, OFDM, BICM type of approach. And if you if you don't iterate, you gain. If you iterate, you gain a lot. Okay, so if you a few more iterations, I'll. Um, We've, we've done this also for MIMO. So in terms of complexity, it, it can be done for MIMO. MIMO is simply uh, where each one of these uh, channels is a high mobility multipath channel. So you have uh, everything scaling up. And we've recently um, got this uh, letter uh, published about the MIMO case. Um, not so much time to talk about it. Uh, but the, the good news is that it's always outperforming the uh, even the message passing, and there are some reasons for that. But the um, that and the complexity is is still uh, affordable. Um, also, it scales with the, the QAM size, so you get very good performance for large QAM. Interesting that when you get the diversity gain of MIMO, so when the number of antenna increases, you even get a higher, better performance. And uh, just recent results, uh, yes, we, we've done um, this the MIMO case, and then the other the other thing uh, we recently have is the uh, a change change in the. Um, in the Zach transform, the discrete instead of doing discrete Zach transform where you do uh, endpoint FFT or IFFT, uh, we replace that with the Hadamar transform, and that kind of um, reduces the complexity because Hadamar uh, transforms are really simple in terms of com hardware complexity, and uh, luckily they, the the performance is the same give, uh, under this MRC detection, we get exactly the same performance of, uh, of OTFS. So with a just simplified uh, uh, transmitter structure. So thank you. And uh, please, uh, you can find codes and stuff in, in, the, in our website. So thank you for uh, uh, your attention. I'm happy to hear some questions. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you for impressive talk. But due to the limited time, maybe we have uh, maybe yeah, we only one on question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, okay. One, uh, one. Yeah, uh, I'll just select one of the questions. Um, yeah. uh, Omid has asked, uh, could you elaborate on how windowing uh, to co compact against inter-Doppler interference? Right. So one thing is uh, um, uh, windowing. Windowing in which domain you you want to do it? I don't know. But anyway, let's let's assume if let's say now we are looking at rectangular pulses. So right. we have a rectangular pulse, and uh, in that case, we we have exact uh, the input output relation is uh, is really is has. Let's see if I find the. Yes. So you see with rectangular pulses, we have the input output relation is that twisted convolution. And the twist, because the pulses are rectangular, is just a phase correction, which is good because it's not, not too bad to deal with. When, when you put, uh, if you don't put a, a rectangular pulse, let's say you put a, you know, a, a, sine, a sine pulse, you are actually going to have um, some problems because then there is also the the amplitude of, of that uh, of the of the window which will uh, will affect which in a way you will have uh, different SNR on each sample because of the window and that's not really desirable because then the performance is always dominated by the worst uh, case sample so it it has some drawback in it when you do non non rectangular pulse windowing but it may have it may it may have a, a advantage in reducing the ICI but that our point is if you use MRC detection fractional doppler uh, and the spread of the doppler doesn't affect our detection complexity so that the fractional doppler is kind of uh, 
a bit of an artificial notion because you know Doppler is uh, probably not not the channel is not made of direct pulses. Physical channels are probably blurs of uh, of uh, of scatterers, and um, so that's not really what what we should worry about. But I think that having a detector which is independent of the number of of on the of on the of the spread of the Doppler is uh, is really useful because then uh, you don't care about uh, about the Doppler being spread or not or fractional or non-fractional uh, or if it's even if if you when you pick a small n then your Doppler resolution is very low so you will have Doppler everywhere in all possible in all in all bins so if you when you're in that situation you just don't uh, uh, you you have to you have to deal with that and if you did if you did message passing or other algorithms where, where complexity depends on p you will be hit a lot hard by complexity our point is if you do mrc you do zp otfs and uh, with uh, mrc you don't suffer from that so in a way it becomes less uh, of a problem so i would not suggest to do uh, windowing in time Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. Um, there are still quite a lot of questions, but I think sure. most we of them in, in, later in the panel discussion. Yeah, most, uh, yes. most of the questions are related to the questions we had before. Sure. So uh, shall we move to the panel discussion? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's move to the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will so, uh, so please yes, introduce the uh, panel. Uh, Thanks. Sure, okay. Yeah. Should I stop mm. this? Share. Okay. Ah, thank you. I'll start sharing the yes. Hope everyone can see this. Uh, see my screen. Yes. yes. Ah, thanks. Okay. Um, thank you for the two wonderful speeches. And now let's move to the panel discussion. This time we have invited several very well-known researchers as the panelists. Uh, for discussion. We have Roni Hadani from the University of Te Texas at Austin, uh, Emmanuel Viterbo and at Monash University, who both of them have just gave the keynote speeches. And we also have Professor Jin Hongyuan from University of New South Wales and uh, Professor Hong Yi Hong from Monash University and uh, Professor Arman Fahang from Trinity College Dublin and uh, and uh, Professor Zhi Qiangwei from FAU Erlangen Nuremberg. Let's welcome them. Um, so uh, we have collected several questions regarding the OTFS, and we have tried to summarize them in different aspects. As people, uh, as the researchers here are quite well known with the concept, and we are thinking uh, with those experts involved in today's panel discussion, maybe we can go it in a more uh, mm -hmm non-official that people can share our opinions uh, with the, the topics mm, because the questions, some of them are quite detailed and we perhaps we do not, do not have enough time to discuss very details of each question. So I suggest the panels, uh, the panelists could give some basic ideas towards those questions, okay? So the first one, please join me to, uh, let's have a discussion on the delayed Doppler domain channel characteristics. Here are some questions in this aspect. Uh, there were people are uh, focusing on the typical coherence time and coherence bandwidth in delayed Doppler domain. And also how to measure, uh, is there any real, uh, real world measure data to prove the properties of delay Doppler domain, and also how well the fractional delay or fractional Doppler, for example, affect OTFS design. Um, uh, for all the all experts, if you have any ideas and uh, uh, would like to say something about these questions, please just go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks. I have one remark I can start. Yeah, uh, regarding coherence types, do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. So the way I understand it is the following. Uh, I said it before. So if you accept quasi-periodicity and you accept twisted convolution, uh, then inside an OTFS frame, 
you have a complete coherence. It's like uh, you measure the channel at a certain point in the plane and you can apply the same channel by means of twisted convolution to every other point. So inside the frame, and the frame can be as long as you want and the bandwidth can be as wide as you want, you have in this regard coherence. Among frame, that's a, a different question and, uh, and there are of course similarities between the channel that you measure in one frame and consequent frame, but uh, in particular the delay Doppler characteristics might be similar, but phases will be different. And so, so you cannot just assume that you're going to measure the same channel. So, so inside the frame, coherence, among, in between frame, certain attributes are, are, are slowly varying and other attributes need to be estimated and uh, predicted. So, that's the way I see it. There is one, one, one limitation in how long you can do your frame because yes. eventually, eventually the, the car moves. So it will see a slightly different geometry of, of the scene. So that's, it's a matter of but, scale, but that's true. That, that, that's that's true, the limit, that's the limit. The, the, the geometric that, coherence time, let's call it, is, is important. Yeah. But still, even if things are moving, at least uh, on the pure level, what, what happens when something is moving or something is accelerating? Mm -hmm. The delay topper channel model is maintained. Just that you don't have any more the interpretation of specular reflectors. For example, if you have an accelerating uh, object, what you're going to get is an impulse response which is smeared by some kind of a shear. Uh, it's still a delay Doppler, uh, it's still a delay Doppler uh, impulse response, it's, but it's not, you cannot interpret it as a reflector, it's not a delta. It's yeah. a it's smeared impulse response, it's going to affect the symbol by means of twisted convolution, and all the stationarity things that I just said will maintain, but, uh, you know, it's, it, the, the physical interpretation is different. So, uh, um, Yes. Uh, uh, mm, so, if I could add, sorry. Oh yeah, of course, professor. Oh okay. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, if I could add, I think we probably be a little bit uh, careful about the terminology here and right. the coherence of time, coherence of bandwidth. When we use it in typical mm -hmm. wireless communication textbook, mm -hmm. uh, I think we are marrying wide sense stationary channel. I uh, mean, so that is defined. Uh, mm -hmm from the uh, uh, channel scattering function. So we have a conventional Doppler spread. Then you have the inverse of Doppler spread is your coherence time means within that period of time, the channel does not change. But when we talk about channel, we are talking about the time frequency domain channel. And uh, similarly, when we talk about the coherence uh, bandwidth, we are talking about uh, the uh, you have a delay spread uh, and the uh, uh, inverse of that is your coherence bandwidth. Again, we are talking about the channel amplitude in the time frequency domain, that's not the channel. Mm -hmm. But now I think uh, with the introduction of uh, OTFS, I think uh, Ronnie and uh, Emmanuel already mentioned that we are talking about the different domains or different plane, if I would like to say, the delay Doppler. We probably change the terminology a little bit as well. We are not, uh, uh, we are not uh, marrying the scattering function. We are marrying the correlation function, or you can think about the correlation of a scattering function. So the, to me, I think uh, uh, we probably, I think uh, some textbook mentioned uh, rather than coherence of time, coherence of bandwidth in the delay Doppler domain, they talk about the stationary time and the stationary bandwidth. Basically, if you have a um, um, Doppler, does not change. So the inverse of your Doppler give you stationary time, means within that time, the channel in the delay Doppler domain, your Doppler does not change. Similarly, and you have a correlation of uh, 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 delay. So the correlation delay means within that time, your delay does not change. So, so you, you, you will have a, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, the, uh, the coherent, not coherent, stationary, stationary. 
So yes. obviously, your um, if you have a coherence of time and bandwidth, it give you a small region. You call it a, 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 a coherent region. Later on, your stationary region mirrors what is the range. You have a wide sense of stationary. I think probably that. Uh, yes. I just would like to add that a little bit. Yeah, just uh, hi everyone. Uh, following up on that a bit. So uh, one uh, important point is that OTFS looks at a dynamic uh, scenario where the channel changes, but they consider, in my understanding, the channel to be almost LTI over a subset of samples, which is uh, in the looking at delay time domain. So in the delay dimension, the, your channel is almost LTI. So that's where the channel is. If you want to call it coherent or whatever, uh, you can just uh, consider it that way. But uh, from radar perspective also, that's different. You want to capture everything. So uh, yeah, uh, I agree that the terminology is not probably the right one to use, like coherence time and bandits here. But uh, we should consider all the uh, domains that, for example, Ronnie showed in a very nice uh, figure there. So we are moving always between delay time, delay Doppler, time frequency, uh, you know, uh, frequency Doppler. So we have all these different domains that we can look at the channel and the, take advantage of the properties there. Yes. Thank you, Arman. I think uh, what experts has mentioned, they are quite representative for this type of questions. Like, uh, I think the delay Doppler domain channels, they do have some different properties compared to the time frequency or time delay. Uh, given the time limitation, maybe we could move on to the second aspect, which is the OTFS principles and designs. Uh, people has asked quite a lot about the uh, some several details of the OTFS modulation. Uh, perhaps we can focus in on the first, the time domain post shaping and time frequency domain windowing and the ISFFT and the, the OTFS grid. Please, uh, please just feel free to discuss if you have any suggestions or opinions. Uh, hi, maybe I can add a little bit about the time frequency domain windowing. Sure. Uh, uh, it is uh, mainly useful to improve the sparsity of the delay Doppler domain channel, uh, particularly for a fractional Doppler or fractional delay. If we have a fractional delay or Doppler, the channel will spread in the delay Doppler domain, which results in a very severe uh, inter-Doppler uh, interference and inter-delay interference. So, uh, so uh, impose a window in the time frequency domain is equivalent to in, uh, introduce a future in the uh, uh, in the delay Doppler domain such that the channel spreading can be suppressed in uh, in such a uh, to some to some degree and the resulting channel and the interference patterns in the delay Doppler domain will be uh, more um, need to be uh, equalized or to be estimated Yes, thank you, Zhiqiang. I agree, I agree with you. Do we have any uh, uh, opinions on windowing and uh, post shaping here? I, I would I would uh, of course reiterate what Zhiqiang said because it's 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 very correct. Um, so so as I said, uh, delay Doppler. There, there is something which you should call delay Doppler signal processing. Uh, in the same way that you have signal processing in time, in signal processing in time, a filter is a function that operates by means of convolution. That's what it means to filter in time. In frequency signal processing, a filter is a function on frequency that then operates by multiplication. So there is a concept of filtering in each one of these incarnations of signal processing. In delay Doppler signal processing, a filter is a function, not quasi per just on the delay Doppler domain, and it acts by means of twisted convolution on quasi-periodic signal. Now, now take all the intuition and all the knowledge that you have about the meaning and the utility of filtering in classical signal processing and translate it to this two-dimensional reality. By shaping the filter, you are shaping the physics of the signal. You are shaping the attributes of the signal that you are transmitting 
and the attributes of the signals you are, you are receiving from the perspective of the delay Doppler representation. Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I remember that Professor Vitubo has also another paper talking about uh, uh, using a different kernel other than ISFT for uh, for modulation. Maybe uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, if you would like yeah, yeah, to I can, I can add some comment comments. On that. On. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank I you. On, I, I mentioned it at the end. In fact, I can comment on that. So unfortunately, it destroys the beauty of OTFS because the channel of, is, is in delayed Doppler and uh, you know the, the OTFS uh, or the ZAC transform is perfectly matched to that model. But in the, the, it just happens to, to work well because although the, um, the, in the Hadamard, the, the, we call the, instead of the delay Doppler domain, we call that the delay sequency domain because the equivalent notion of frequency for Hadamard transform is called sequency. And in, in that domain, the channel is not sparse as, as much as in the time is in delay Doppler, uh, but it's also not that uh, dense. So you just have a little bit more samples, uh, more um, paths, equivalent paths in this delay sequency domain, which again, it doesn't hurt for, for our detection because of the, that MRC detection is kind of insensitive to to having many paths along the 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 sequence or the, pre, the Doppler domain, so that's that's why um, it it was it, it and then it happens to it still it still whatever you think of uh, of what is the D, the DFT doing it's spreading uh, you know uh, spreading symbols across uh, the entire vector. So you you apply you apply. Uh, uh, the DFT of a pulse, you get right. a flat, something right. spread everywhere. So what all the transforms end up doing that, in particular, Hadamard transform is a constant modulus, which means they, they all have, they're just plus and minus ones, which is it's, it's kind of even simpler than the, the Fourier where you have ex complex exponential and it costs you complex multipli multiplications when you have to implement. So Hadamard is just addition and subtraction. That's the big gain in complexity. And uh, we, we do see what the sequency domain is, but it doesn't have a physical meaning as, okay. as uh, the delay Doppler domain. That's, that's, it's not matched. It just happens to work, okay? That's, what, that's uh, my only explanation why the Hadamard uh, is, is that it, it just works. But it has to be done with uh, with MRC detection and with okay. the ZP ZP um, structure. Okay, thank you, Professor. Yeah, just uh, maybe one more point uh, to of add course. on the transformations. Uh, we uh, also here looked at starting from OTFS uh, that does some sort of channel compression. I would like to call it. Uh, so then we uh, thought of looking into DCT transform also to compress further. But the problem there is that uh, when you change the transformation, then you lose the uh, nice properties of OTFS that you have circular convolutions everywhere, which are quite important in uh, practical implementations of the system, because eventually we want to have it working in fully operational communication. Uh, system. So uh, just looking into uh, a word of caution, I would like to add on, in looking into trans different transformation, it's like Hadamard transform has this nice uh, diodic uh, convolution property there that is somehow uh, useful. That's how it, in my understanding, uh, it, it works. But and also it, an important point about OTFS is that any single data uh, symbol you transmit experiences exact same channel. That's yes. why you can use isolated pilot and estimated channel, while other transformations may not satisfy this condition. Yes. Can I add uh, something maybe. small? I think it's an important yeah. point. Of course. Well, I agree completely with everything that Emmanuel said and Armand said uh, and Wei said. Um, just this is important. So 
as an engineering problem, if you are only focused on communication and fast equalization and spreading by means of detecting the modes of the channel, there are many, many twists that you can do. For example, replacing the precoding system from, the, from FFT to Hadamard. But if you want a consistent mathematical structure that gives you a, 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 give you a framework to do signal processing as a whole, filtering, sampling, everything in a consistent manner, you cannot, you cannot, it's very rigid. It's the ZAC and that's it. And I, I would say it because I want to contrast it with coming to the Fourier transform and trying to twist the Fourier transform. Nobody will, if, if you are interested in signal processing, you won't try to twist the Fourier transform because when you twist the Fourier transform, everything breaks down, all the structure breaks down. Right. So you don't want to twist the ZAC transform for the same reason. But mathematics aside and practical kinds of considerations aside, different realities. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, sorry, can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, it is a question I want to ask after Emmanuel's uh, talk. Uh, as Emmanuel mentioned that uh, the, uh, your proposed uh, MRC-based uh, rack receiver can handle the fractional Doppler or the um, uh, symbol spreadings in the sequence dimension. Uh, as my understanding is that you uh, just, uh, you, you um, I mean, you perform an MRC to um, combining the information in the Doppler or the sequence dimension, uh, regardless of it is fractional or not. Um, yeah. So what, what my, my question is, why are you using MRC? It is very similar to a spatial multiplexing or, or like a MIMO channel in the Doppler dimension or the sequence dimension. Uh, yeah maybe a zero forcing uh, combining or some, something um, uh, MMSE combining may uh, have a better performance. Have you tried this before? Uh, mm, well, we haven't tried other combining, but, we, but, but the problem there is to com you know, the information, each information symbol gets spread across, diff goes into different uh, received symbols, samples, why? So the, the 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 MRC is needed to from each in each equation there is a, an xi vector symbol vector that you want to estimate. Uh, you want to let's say combine all the 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 samples in uh, in the optimal way and maximum ratio combining is the optimal way to to combine multiple uh, paths. If, if when you have uh, diversity combining techniques, MRC is the optimal diversity combining. And in, M in uh, you do diversity combining when you have the same signal transmitted coming through different um, channels, and then they, they get a different, uh, different fade and a different noise. You, when you want to combine that, the M maximum ratio combining is, is, is optimal in, uh, in that, for that reason. That's, and we just apply it within the, the, the iterative uh, decoder. Uh, so we, we just combine it that way. That's, that's the reason for MRC uh, doing that. W okay, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Um, Give me the time. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. If I, if I could, uh, of course. If I could add my two cents regarding the first question here, I think it's a very important and it's a big question. I don't have a, a directly answer, but I think uh, for any modulation and uh, post shaping, I'm talking about post shaping in terms of or time shaping rendering. I'm only talking about post shaping for any practical modulation. Post shaping is very important and. Uh, as uh, Ronnie mentioned in his talk, uh, and uh, the, the system is, has a bandwidth limited. You have to have a good pulse shaping and uh, to, to get rid of, I mean, uh, Nyquist pulse or other pulses to get rid of for ISI. But here, I think it's more important because we are working for wireless system. If we don't get good pulse shaping, we will have a severe OB um, outside the band emission. Uh, so for practical system, uh, we probably need to do this one. We don't see many work here. I, I remember Emmanuel has a one paper on this one and, uh, and probably um, uh, is a kind of an important area need to be taken. Yes. 
Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, so for the second page of OTFS principles, people are asking about the uh, intrinsic relationships between OTFS, Zark, Zark transform and uh, short time Fourier transform. And uh, there are also some questions about the achievable reads. And also, uh, is there a different design uh, criteria for the number of grids in time domain, uh, time frequency domain or delay Doppler domain? Um, yes, please feel free to discuss. I can start. Yeah, of course. Um, OTFS is the Zach transform. Okay. Let's start with that. Let's, let's build a very simple, a, a, a very simple a, a mental a point of view about OTFS. OTFS is the Zach transform. That's it. Period. No, no more, a, a, no more deliberation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once you understand that, you can move on and say, okay, can I approximate OTFS? Can I build approximate variants of OTFS that, uh, or sometimes even equivalent, uh, but, but typically these are approximate. And then there are, you can approximate OTFS by means of symplectic Fourier transform and then OFDM. It's, a, it's an approximation of OTFS. It's not the two of OTFS. Uh, it approximates OTFS in low velocity uh, because it, it, it approximates the, the twisted convolution channel interaction with a convolution, circular convolution channel interaction, okay? Which, which, make, which maintains uh, as long as the velocities are, are, are small. Um, so this is my, my this is really I want to emphasize it. OTFS is the ZAC transform, and this is where you have to start, and from there you branch. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. Mm. So um, I have seen Professor Fahan has a paper talking about uh, uh, the achievable rates of OTFS and OFDM. Could you elaborate on this topic? Yeah, just in that work, we looked at the uh, uh, capacity of uh, right. OTFS in single antenna and uh, MIME scenarios. So our finding was that it's the same as OFDM. Yeah. But the question is, where is OTFS winning? And uh, uh, I, I think other measures such as probability of outage and stuff like that can be looked at and uh, calculated. And there could be uh, the advantage of OTFS. There are other works I've seen that they show a bit higher uh, sum rate uh, from Giuseppe Kyre's group uh, recently. And that, that would be a good reference, but yeah, that the rate is the same, short answer there. I can end my two cents about it. Uh, OTFS is an orthogonal modulation. It's unitarily equivalent to any other orthogonal modulation. In terms of capacity, abstract measure of capacity, OTFS has the same capacity as TDMN and OFDM. Uh, so that's on the information theoretic level. Um, yeah, it's, they are all unitarily equivalent. Uh, where the gain come from, it won't come from capacity measure. <laughs> it will come from other means. One, from everything I've seen so far, one source of advantage is the fact that OTFS does not suffer uh, intercalar interference. Namely, you can measure the channel, and then using the analytic formula of twisted convolution, you can equalize it using a message passing receiver in a manner that will give you uniform performance for any velocity. Uh, this is something that it's very difficult to implement in other modulation. Uh, that's one source of uh, gain that I that I was able to to you know, to to. Thank you, understand. thank you, Ron. Uh, I have just received some discussions regarding this the exact the same. Uh, topic. Uh, people are asking, well, the correlated channel affect the capacity for both OTFS or FDM. Is there like maybe in general, generally speaking, if the channel condition is different, is there a possible difference between OTFS and OFDM in terms of the achievable rates? I don't, I didn't understand the question. Again, what's uh, the question? Sorry. The question, uh, I think what they means is like uh, if the channel has some specific uh, for example, correlations between different paths, well, that affect the capacity 
for both OTFS or OFDM, maybe. Is it about MIMO maybe that you have correlated uh, channels different yes. antennas or yes I, I yes okay so um, yeah not sure <laughs> <laughs> um, I can say something about it uh, again it's not uh, the, right. the, the work about MIMO in OTFS is uh, in its infancy uh, there are some works uh, but there is one thing about MIMO that I can add. Typical, there are two types. So, so first of all, in order for OTFS to be to shine, you need to do non-linear signal processing. You, you, linear equalization in OTFS does not allow OTFS to shine over other uh, modulation techniques. Okay. So, but uh, so you have to apply non-linear processing, and by non-linear processing, I mean including a subtraction, a not only rejection. You don't want only to do zero forcing. You want to subtract, you want to do decision feedback. For example, uh, and in precoding, it means that you want to precode using Tomlinson Arashima and not precode using uh, now. When you do nonlinear processing, then of course OTFS has a distinct advantage that all the passes are separated from one another and right. you can subtract them. Yes. And, and this, this is a principle, again, it's not a proof, but this is a principle that can be exploited in the, in the delay Doppler domain and cannot be exploited in the time frequency domain. In the time frequency domain, when you're trying to equalize or pre-equalize a, a MIMO channel, you cannot subtract because now the things are not separated. So you can, you can only reject. Uh, you can do Tomlinson Arashima to some extent, but it's a very degenerate form of Tomlinson Arashima. It's only along the spatial domain. In OTFS, you can actually do Tomlinson Arashima along delay, Doppler, and spatial domain. And, and, and this is a source of advantage. I see. And, and this should be done, you know, it's not, I'm not sure there are a lot of published work about this aspect. Okay, thank you, yeah. Ronnie. Just, just Ronnie, on just my own. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yes. sorry. Just a follow up, uh, Ronnie, your, your suggestion. If we do termination uh, pre-coding and uh, uh, you can also do regularized channel inversion as people did for conventional, um, what is it called, the OFDM MIMO system. Mm -hmm. Is there any comparable performance or gain or loss in that? Oh, nonlinear will always win against mm -hmm. the rejection. You, do, you can do regularized, you can do whatever. If you do nonlinear, uh, you, will, you will gain. You will, you will, achieve, you are, you will achieve capacity. All the rejection, regularized or not, will not achieve capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. Will not achieve the MIMO capacity. The, the, the ones which are decision feedback, especially in the precoding, because decision feedback in the receiver have error propagation. Decision feedback in the precoding doesn't have error propagation. So when you do Tomlinson Arashima, uh, you achieve capacity. Um, so so it, has a, it will give you better performance. Yeah, uh, I know if you do that uh, interference at THP precoding and you have a, if you have a quite a few passes, you probably need to do quite a abstractions at the transmitter side. And you have to do subtraction, that's true. But think yeah. about it. Subtract, that, that there is also an, an interesting, another interesting attribute here. That subtraction is a cheap operation. Yeah. Subtracting the interference only means that you measure the channel the downlink mm -hmm. channel, and then you subtract the effect of the interfering symbol using your channel. You don't need to invert anything. You just need to subtract. Many subtractions, okay. And then after you subtract everything, you are left with some very simple, uh, a simple matrix inversion, which is the residual thing that you need to actually invert. So in fact, subtraction, this paradigm of nonlinear signal processing, after a certain MIMO degree can have lower complexity than the paradigm of inverting many, many matrices in the time frequency domain. So in the delay Doppler domain, all the complexity is moved into subtractions, which are cheap, and then you are left with an inversion of a single matrix. While in the time frequency domain, you are inverting many, many single matrices without subtraction, basically. If you- uh, so Sorry, yeah, please go. Yeah. No, I, I, I just, uh, uh, hi, I, I'm Yi Hong. 
So I just follow Jing Hong's question. So if you have multiple paths, you do THP. So it's typically it related to the path, the, the, the magnitude. If it's very tiny path magnitude, so the inversion, I mean, the, the, the THP, um, uh, I mean, if your starting point is a THP, the magnitude is, uh, the, the path is very, very uh, low magnitude. So will it bring the inaccuracy of THP precoding and, uh, and it will bring the difficulty? We implement, okay, I, uh, these are all very good questions. Uh, I can just say that we in Cohere, Cohere actually implemented THP uh, and built a, a system which delivered, you know, already in 2017, delivered seven, 16 layers over the air with 100, something like 128 QAM using THP. And, and we were not being able to achieve that using any other means. It, will, it requires THP. Uh, this does not answer your question. Uh, your question is how sensitive is THP to all these effects? These are all things that needs to be uh, rigorously investigated. Uh, but I know THP, the good thing is if you do it in the precoding part, then the receiver is very trivial. It's very, I agree. It's very I agree. simplified. Yeah. I agree. No, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a very appealing technology. It's a very appealing technology to be implemented in next generation. And I think delay Doppler is a perfect uh, coordinate system to, to apply it. In. It's very, it, it, yeah. When you do THP, Ronnie, and uh, at the end of the day, are you going through the loops, say A to B, B to C, C to D, D probably going back to A, you, uh, when you have a loop, you probably. Oh yeah, they did a all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, can I ask about one more question? Last question, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, Ronnie, is your THP being done in the delay Doppler domain, right? Yes. And uh, is this still uh, applicable when fractional Doppler yes, or delay no, happens? No, this THP was implemented in a real system. So, so fractional, non fractional, everything. You, you cannot uh, assume anything. It, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a THP again, it, it, was, it was a little bit simplified if I remember correctly along the Doppler. So it was mm -hmm. THP mainly along the delay. So we did something, I think along the Doppler we did rejection, we didn't need subtraction. So because it was in the context of a fixed wireless access system. So we assume the Dopplers are small and in general on the Doppler we only did rejection. But we did full THP along delay, fractional or non fraction. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, it's crucial to, to have a, a good channel to, to see THP work properly. You need a, a, a relatively well-behaved channel. Otherwise, may not may not be as effective. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry to interrupt. We actually have another section just talking about OTIFS with Memo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So let, let's move on to the next. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, there's other questions talking about the channel estimation and the data transmission for OTFS, and uh, also uh, if the performance and the complexity is better than o OFDM, and also how to cancel out the intercell interference in the delay Doppler domain, uh, uh, well maintain delay Doppler domain channel sparsity, and something like that. Please feel free. There is more complexity to equalize OTFS. Uh, there are no free lunches. Uh, there is more complexity, but, uh, but because of the great work of many people here, uh, it's a manageable complexity. And uh, so, so we are not, we are, I don't think we, we can build a chip that implement this equalizer. And uh, yes, and after you build the chip, you forget about the complexity, you already have a chip. <laughs> And nobody asks the question anymore. So I think we are now in the position that one can build a chip that implement an equalizer for OT. So, so but there is yeah. more complexity. Yeah. 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 But we are gaining, we are gaining mobility. You know, we are gaining yeah. high mobility. I mean, the price we, we are paying complexity to to have a system which will work well in high mobility. And that's I mean, 
you know, we 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 were having when we had OFDM, we we gained the uh, multipath and complexity. You know, the, they had to design the chips with the FFTs with massive FFTs. So they paid that price because there was a reward, and I think there is a reward to to make system work in high mobility. Yeah, and I even even right. when it's not high, even when the mobility is not high. OTFS works better because it has right. intrinsically some, you know, there is some diversity gain through yes. OTFS, yeah. even in yeah. static channel. Uh, yes. I, I think there is many uh, debate about OFDM because they said uh, many questions will say you can increase data F, uh, the carrier spacing or add channel coding. Uh, very long, dangerous. Very, very long dangerous. channel code. <laughs> So no, yeah. no, no, I, I heard the, uh, many questions about that. Uh, oh, I was, I was, by the way, I was participating uh, regretfully so in the, in the 5G standard deliberation. I have a mm -hmm. lot of stars on my back. Um, now, you can, you can achieve, you can tweak, you can do hacking to OFDM and, and resolve many, many problems as long as you isolate, as long as you isolate it. So you can solve the diversity problem. You know, the end. You can you can interleave, right. and and it will give yeah. you diversity gain equivalent to OTFS as long as the bandwidth and the durations are are the same. Uh, you can solve you can solve intercarrier interference by increasing the subcarrier spacing. Mm. Okay, you can. But what happens? <laughs> but then you have one you have one sheet and it's short here and long there, because what happens when you increase the subcarrier spacing? You shrink the symbol time. What happens when you shrink the symbol time? The delay spread is a delay spread. So the cyclic prefix should stay the same, and the cyclic prefix overhead grows proportionally. So you cannot. You are you, either your legs or your head will be outside your uh, blanket. So and that's the problem. While in OTFS, you can achieve all these benefits, or you you can hope to achieve all the benefits while covering all the parts of your body with the same black. <laughs> yeah, just uh, on the uh, weak points uh, side, I would uh, like to add the uh, guard band uh, for the isolated uh, pilot you put in there, especially when you have multi-user scenario. Um, yeah, that's not the most efficient way of doing uh, things. Therefore, I mean, it's it's possible to use other type of pilots there. The, in fact, there is some uh, uh, work on uh, you know uh, superimposing a pilot with high power so that in normal fashion type thing you mm -hmm. can just estimate the, the channel to interference cancellation. But that's uh, that's a limitation in current literature yeah. that we need solutions for basically. Okay. Very good point. Pilot, pilot can have a damaging effect also on the PAPR. So if you, of course, you if you boost your pilot, then your even you will damage the PAPR of, of your signal. So that's if, maybe if you have a, isolated pilot though, because of zeros you put around it, you can add yeah. those the power of those to this pilot yeah, and yeah. then. In delay time, it gets the spread, right? So it yes, has yes. the same power as the rest of your signal. Yes. But yeah, you can't increase too much. Mm -hmm. you, you will probably enlarge the guard band as well if you isolated the pilot there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, how about the intercell interference? Is there a way to deal with the intercell interference for OTFS? I think again, uh, from the experience that I have uh, from Cohere, um, I don't see specific advantages on one domain okay. compared to the other. Okay. Uh, Intercell interference should be dealt with on the level of network. Probably cooperate, uh, right. MIMO, co cooperation between the base stations. That's, that's mm -hmm. the, probably the way to go uh, and beam forming uh, in one way or another. I don't see how delay Doppler, but maybe, you know, I'm short-sighted. Oh, no. I am short-sighted, <laughs> but maybe I'm also short-sighted. <laughs> no. But uh, can I ask, uh, 
does the pilot contamination exist in multi-cell OTFS systems? That's a very good, ah, that's, that's a very good point. Thanks, Yuri. So one of the main problems with, a, with time frequency channels, think about it. The channel that you measure over a carrier is instantaneous channel. Instantaneous channel and yep. it is corrupted severely by contamination. And once it is corrupted, you are done. You are dead. So, so, so because you, you measure the channel, the channel is corrupted. It's a very unstable structure, the time frequency channel, because carrier by carrier, it's a different channel and, and, and corrupted by contamination and noise. You know, in OTFS, the channel is much more stable. It is averaged. These are the reflectors. And think about it, the, the sensors, these reflectors are average over the full band and the full duration of the frame. So it's a much more stable measurement yes. uh, under contamination and noise. And, uh, and this is something that we've seen and we are taking advantage in, in all the implementations of OTFS. That's a very good point. So this is, I, I would... think, the core advantage of OTFS. Uh, delay Doppler for uh, multi-cell. The contamination of the channel measurement, which is, which is a fundamental limitation of all these uh, multi-cell uh, systems. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I think I would like to add uh, one more point that for inter cell interference, uh, you have a, the, if you can see the OTFS is a two-dimensional spreading, you probably have uh, the property of a CDMA and the interference uh, is not, in a big junk, uh, in either like a TDMA or like a, 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 um, um, FDMA, you, you have this big uh, interference in particular time slot or particular uh, uh, frequency band. So the interference is somehow average there. Probably it is uh, more robust. Uh, yes. uh, that's just intuitive. I'm not quite sure this is the case. I haven't done anything. I, I, in this I agree world. with you. I'm short sighted. Yeah, you are right. You are right. Uh, Aspect is uh, the CDMA attributes of OTFS clearly have relation, strong relation to, to behavior under, under a multi cell interference. That's for sure. Uh, what the behavior is, is, is a different question, but for sure it will behave differently. I, I really, I take back what I said in the beginning. And uh, these are two good points. Yeah, okay. well, on top of that, uh, and uh, Zhichan mentioned this uh, pilot contamination. I think uh, here your pilot is quite different. I mean, it really depends on the OTFS, your pilot signal is just, uh, you know, as uh, presented by Ronnie and uh, Emmanuel, the pilot is there, it's quite different from the pilot sequence of what we use it to do here. I think yes. you are in different, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I think I probably need to investigate it. Uh, the, the design scenario will be quite different as what if, we did if, before. Uh, yeah, I, I can add that the pilot, when you, you are, we are putting, the, let's say we embed the pilot in delay Doppler domain, this mm -hmm. gets spread, completely spread in, uh, in time frequency, time frequency. And, yeah. and even in time. And in time. So right. it does get spread uh, a lot. So if, uh, I think it can induce some you, you may lose some pieces in time of that pilot but i think it's still enough to to reconstruct the the channel uh, you know you may miss a few samples of the pilot and but you may still reconstruct the pi the, the channel uh approximately yes. with some with some limited error so it i i i have the just the my intuition is that it should be less uh, disturbed by Intercell uh, interference or on yes. the on the on the pilot. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> okay. Now let's turn to OTFS memo. There are quite a lot of questions regarding this one. Um, so basically. Um, uh, they were talking about the low complexity precoding, which we actually have discussed a little bit before, and also the the advantages and the challenges of OTFS in massive memo and also how to design closed loop memo pre-coding or say like more specifically in which domain should we, should we design pre-coding, okay? Hmm. 
So in, in terms of uh, massive MIMO uh, work, we recently looked at application of considering um, locally LTI channel uh, in, in every M uh, number of samples. And uh, then we can estimate the channel in the middle of that. That's the best point to estimate the channel, that block of M samples. And uh, consider the channel completely LTI, apply a simple time reversal technique to do uh, the for combining it could in terms of pre-coding the, the story is different but for combining we are just using that and we get the uh, so-called channel hardening effects and uh, the correlation uh, functions of the channel started to appear so uh, when we have time varying channel a bezel function appeared there as a result of the doppler uh, shift and we simply could invert that effect and gain a lot of performance uh, uh, compared with the static case. So we could reach almost to static uh, channel bitter rate. Uh, so for the downlink, I believe for pre-coding this vessel information, if you know the maximum Doppler shift uh, or Doppler spread, let's uh, say you can uh, use that vessel function so that when the signal from multiple antennas goes through the channel, it averages out to that function and you can do pre-coding and uh, get gains there for the, for the downlink pre-coding. But, but still, this is a work in, in progress uh, from our side, but the results are quite promising. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, uh, any suggestions for the closed loop memo precoding? And uh, maybe given given the frame size, maybe it, it's the outdated CSI will be a problem for closed loop memo. Not sure because the the channel is varying <laughs> over time. So if, if there's a way to extrapolate, though. If there is a way to extrapolate, maybe there could be opportunities there, I would say. I agree. agree. I think it's really depending on the, if the channel is, uh, how stable the channel is. Yeah. Okay. If I could add, I think when talking about the outdated CSI, um, as we are working on time uh, delay Doppler domain and the channel is less outdated, in delayed Doppler <laughs> domain compared to you time could quickly yeah. outdated in the time frequency domain. That's a good Probably point. Probably that's uh, something I can, yeah. Yeah. And also for closed loop MIMO precoding, uh, 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 most straightforward is uh, uh, by exploiting the channel reciprocity to uh, estimating the channel and uh, doing the precoding design. Yes, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. OK, let's keep going to some applications of OTFS. Uh, as OTFS has attracted a lot of attention, people are thinking maybe it is OK to apply OTFS to other aspects, for example, like uh, underwater communications and or for physical layer security or even for radar sensing. Uh, I'm sure that there are some like a uh, preliminary works have been done in those aspects. Perhaps we, uh, you can elaborate on some of them, please. I can uh, maybe I can talk, uh, uh, yeah, Ronnie, please. please, please. Anyway, uh, okay, uh -huh. I will say a few very short thing and then you will take the top um, So first of all, there is work about underwater acoustic communication. Uh, the Doppler is accentuated there. In fact, I think in underwater communication, the the, the, Doppler, the Doppler shift is comparable, the, the bandwidth is comparable to the frequency, to the carrier frequency. So, so yes. they already, you are dealing with the kind of acceleration there. But uh, I think it's very suitable for this. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very suitable for, for a situation where Doppler effects are accentuated because the carrier wavelength is much shorter. And the uh, security purpose, OTFS is CDMA. Now we didn't talk about it in this deliberation, but OTFS uh, is not only spread in terms of sensing the channel mode. OTFS or variants of OTFS 
can actually be spread in terms of spread spectrum. You can actually build an OTFS variant, we didn't talk about this at all yet, you can build spread versions of OTFS, which actually smear over a larger bandwidth and over a large, like really like CDMA, while maintaining all the OTFS attributes, and this, and, and this can, this has a application for security. So on different modes, you can, you are secure on the level that you can communicate under the noise level. Just very, very low power communication and exploiting all the processing gain that this spread spectrum techniques gives you. And it's also security because you can, you can use the spreading as a code that give you of security for your transmission. And the comparison between OTFS and OFDM for sensing, it's an interesting question. I don't know what information theory have to say about that. Perhaps it have to say that all waveforms are as good as all other waveforms for sensing, it's like for some, <laughs> some kind of a abstract reason. But OTFS, if you don't know information theory, you just think about what OTFS is, it's it's the optimal radar waveform. That's what it is. It's like, it, 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 this is radar. Uh, if you go back into all the literature about radar and you try to translate it to something that you can understand, you will eventually, you will, you will, you will come up with OTFS. That's a very interesting point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I want to say something more about radar because I thought about it. Uh, I don't know if this will be interest for this audience, but I would say it anyhow. Uh, radar have a fundamental uh, problem in the in the definition of its fundament of its problem. In radar theory, the main problem is designing is designing uh, signals which have specific ambiguity function. Yeah, right. that's the right. problem in radar theory. For people from radar, you are trying to come up with a waveform which has specific ambiguity function, desired ambiguity function, typically some localization properties of the ambiguity function. This is a highly nonlinear problem. And there is no solution to this problem. People don't, there are some ad hoc constructions, but there is no systematic way to design radar signals under constraints on the ambiguity function. Uh, this is very important. It's not like designing filters, which is a linear problem. Designing radar waveform is a nonlinear problem which does not admit a, 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 a solution. While, and I think this is, a, this is a diversion, I think that the radar problem is designing a delay Doppler filter. Oh, That's wow. the problem of radar. radar. Radar theory is not about designing waveform of specific uh, ambiguity function. Radar theory is designing delay Doppler filters that you can decorate your delta in delay Doppler. Right. And the designing delay Doppler filters is a linear problem. You can design any filter that you want while paying the bandwidth and duration that the filter will require. And this makes radar problem a linear problem. And I think that's the correct way to think about the radar problem. And this makes it solvable. Uh, using traditional signal processing techniques. And for me, this was a big revelation. And I don't mm -hmm. know how much it is well known in the, in the community. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, you have mentioned a few good, very good points. I think they are quite uh, enlightening. Um, do we have any elaborations on the, oh yeah, comment, of course. Comment on, on that. Um, that that's, that's really nice about radar, but I think the other big difference within in radar that they are just inter interested. I, I mean, they don't really see the phase. While it, when we do OTFS, well, the late Doppler channel estimation, we get amplitude and phase of the channel. Now, I don't know. You can you eventually can use that maybe to do super resolution, or uh, because by measuring that phase, you can you can kind of get a higher resolution effect. On, on the radar and and probably that's what they do in radar right? but but now we have a tool that can estimate the the magnitude and phase of each scatter in, in mm -hmm. of the radar that that's that's an advantage and i i really like the point that that, that ronnie made that uh now you remember the 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 zach domain uh, 
two-dimensional sync pulse, right? Yes. That's the sync pulse, and we know it's bad. It's not concentrated. You can you can shape that pulse to make it nicer and make it even more concentrated, so that the the resolution of the radar in, is improved by that, by shaping that pulse and. And we know how to shape pulses very well. In, yeah. And that's your filter design, what you mentioned is exactly that. Thinking of, uh, of that 2D, two-dimensional sync becomes something which has, uh, uh, is maybe more concentrated, concentrated yeah. and uh, yeah. And you don't need to deal with ambiguity function and all these. Yes, uh, that's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> ambiguity function <laughs> for <laughs> communication people, it's a nightmare. I, I, I struggle to really <laughs> get down to the bottom of what it means. Uh, and <laughs> but yeah, that, that's true. That, that's true. I think uh, there could be one way to link a radar. And uh, I mean, although we don't like as a communication, we don't like uh, the ambiguity function. I think in either uh, Emmanuel or Ronnie's presentation, you link them to the uh, what is called uh, the the matched filter, which, yes, the match uh, filter. which both the communication and uh, radar that uh, people do. So somehow, if there's a link, also that is linked to the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 topic you mentioned that is. Uh, uh, delta function, 2D delta functions. If we can link them together, probably that's a way to help to. Design. In fact, I did it. I have to say, uh, secretly, I was, I was so, I was curious about it. So, in fact, I have some, some, some private notes. So, I, and again, I can give it to the audience as an exercise. I think yep. everyone in this audience <laughs> can solve it. Uh, take a delayed Doppler pulse mm. and calculate its ambiguity function. And what you're going to get is a very interesting ambiguity function. You are going to get an ambiguity. I will tell you the answer and you try to get it. And uh, what you're going to get is an ambiguity function which looks like this. You have the time frequency grid, which is the reciprocal of the delay Doppler grid. Think about it. You have the delay Doppler grid, so you have the reciprocal time frequency grid. You will get an ambiguity function, which is basically a very narrow pulse at zero, zero. And then repeated at every grid point. And, and going, and the power is diminishing as, as you go to infinity. So you are going to get this kind of, uh, you are going to get an ambiguity function which is very different than Gaussian. It's very narrow, it's a, it's a thumbnail at zero, zero with an empty space around it, and then repeating over the grid points to infinity while the envelope is going down. And, and that's the kind of ambiguity function which is associated with delayed Doppler pulses. And this is a very good ambiguity function for radar, as long as the velocities that you are measure are, are smaller than the empty space around zero, zero. That's a very good result. <laughs> it's very I nice. So it's, 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 it's just a computation. You just compute and you get. Okay, it um, seems like we have quite a lot of interest for Rita. Yeah. There's another section just talking about the connections of <laughs> <laughs> OTFS and uh, Rita. You should put that question in this section. <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah. should actually, yeah. So basically, uh, we have briefly discussed how to design OTFS in the Rita system. And yeah, uh, yeah just a few questions, uh, maybe more detailed, like how to do parameter estimation. And is there a... a very difficulty for OTFS to be implemented in ISAC, like uh, integrated sensing and communication. Yeah. I think this is one of the greatest venues to, in, to, to study OTFS. Uh, if you ask me just, you know, academically, mm -hmm. investigating OTFS in the context of sensing and radar and parameter estimation, that's a, a wonderful place to be. It's it, it clearly a, a change it clearly gives you a fresh perspective about what the radar problem is, and it has high chances of giving you fresh perspective about every one of the problems which are specified. I'm not saying I have an answer to any one of them, but <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. If I would be a, a young researcher today, I would go there. I would just say that's something that for sure will yield results. Mm. 
didn't answer any one of these questions. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's totally fine. To <laughs> <laughs> Those questions are very detailed. Uh, mm, but the answer actually... is probably uh, how to design OTFS in radar system. Well, that's yes. a big question, but the, the answer is yes, 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 for all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ah, no, sorry, it's not yet. These are these are digital questions. Sorry, sorry. All right. I said what I said. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Um, yes, I think I agree. I think we have pretty much covered all those questions like for OTF and the OFDM in, in readers. Uh, let's move on. There's mm -hmm. another one uh, talking about hardware designs uh, of implementation for the ISFT. Uh, actually, I think this, this question is somehow related to the keynote presentations today that we, where we talk about the, the ZAC transforms for the uh, implementation. Maybe there is a way for a cheaper comp uh, hardware complexity to, to implement? I have my perspective, but mm -hmm. I'm not, I will not impose it on anybody on this panel. My perspective <laughs> is that uh, OTFS should be implemented using the ZAC transform. So you should build uh, not using ISFFT. Uh, okay. OTFS should be implemented using the ZAC transform. Uh, so you should implement in hardware the ZAC transform. This is not so difficult. And you should implement in hardware all the signal processing. You should, I, I can envision a chip that solely a, a, a devoted delayed Doppler signal processing. Like you have a chip doing a signal processing, you have a chip doing delayed Doppler signal processing, uh, including ZAC transform and all of that. Uh, and one of the uh, challenges, quote unquote, in implementing OTFS as it should, is that now you, 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 you need to match it with existing standards, which actually use numerology and grids in time frequency. So you, how to marry the ZAC transform with a, the numerology and the grids in time and frequency, so that OTFS will, will, will be capable to be implemented in the context of the existing standards. You, you see, it's, it's, it's not realistic to think that OTFS, the ZAC transform, I believe that the standard, even the FIG-G, will incorporate the, the many of the numerologies that we see today in 5G. So, but it will allow new waveforms to come into the, into the game, like OTFS. So you need to find a way to marry the ZAC transform with the, with the with the framework of uh, LT. Yes, that's my so, uh, that's my perspective. Yeah, on, on this uh, we we have all the elements required to build uh, Zach transform. What what you do on the rows row wise I FFT for the transmitter implementation is simply a number of OFDM transmitters that you have in parallel, so you can take advantage of parallel processing then and uh, just uh, implement it. So all, all the elements are already there and chips are there to uh, uh, perform a Fourier transform across the rows here and then you interleave them, right? So you, you get OTFS modulation. And in fact, for implementation of it, uh, it can be even uh, if M times N is equal to the number of subcarriers of an OFDM block, then n is smaller than that, and even complexity of the modem design, not detection, is simpler than OFDM. So you can afford more complexity for your detection there. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the complexity, I actually just got a question from the audience asking for a uh, uh, inverse discrete ZAC transform. Is there uh, so far? Is there a practical hardware implementation? Uh, on for OTFS using or either ISFFT or inverse discrete ZAC transform. The question is whether there is a chip that, that do it or a, I a think FDA. I think so. Yeah, if there's a chip or a very mature way uh, to no, do it. No, no, not that I know. I know that Coir implemented on FPGA OTFS, okay. uh, but a uh, chip doing all this stuff, I don't think uh, I, I I didn't hear about something like this. Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah. The transmitter is not so hard. I mean, it's, it's just a, a, a 
uh, set of uh, DFTs, right? And they are of endpoint DFTs right? by the rows. So in terms of complexity, it depends on M and N. So if, if N is smaller than M, you even reduce your complexity, but that depends on, on other. I mean, the choice of M and N, maybe we didn't really discuss much where you would want to use one or the other, but um, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, complexity there, that's, I think the problem is the complexity of the receiver because there is a bit of extra work because we are, we are processing two dimensional uh, signals which have interference. So we, we have to do, I mean, we treat, we vectorize everything and it's still sparse. So there are many things that can be simple, but it, the, I think the real, when we look at the hardware problems is that we have these massive frames. So uh, if you, you need to store the whole massive frame and process that, and, and probably you need to buffer the next one while it's coming. So while you process one, and I guess those, the size of M and N is probably uh, going to be limited by the hardware because when you have very mass, uh, we, are, we, we were looking at, you know, 2K uh, OFDM and then N is 128. So you easily blow up the, the size of memory, just the buffer to, to, to receive your, your signal, your, your sample. So that's big. Yeah. But, uh, but in terms of uh, operation, it's not much more complex than, than, uh, than an iterative detection uh, method. I mean, what's being used for, for CDMA is probably the, the you know, CDMA receivers had to face a kind of a similar problem in uh, doing multi-user detection, you know, is that that complexity. I think it's, it's a bit lower than a multi-user detection for CDMA in that sense. Uh, thank you I, very I much. I tend to agree oh, yeah. with Emmanuel here. I think, uh, uh, and all other uh, panel members here, as a transmitter side, uh, because you are using Eurale, we are using small n, so you can use this uh, uh, FFT parallel and uh, have a low complexity. Uh, receiver side, receiver is an issue and uh, due to this high mobility and the high Doppler, but it really depends on what you compare. If you compare OFDM, if you OFDM working in high mobility environment, you do need to do similar thing to deal with the Doppler issue. So complexity is an issue there as well. And I, I, from another angle, I think uh, latency probably is the issue here. And, uh, um, but uh, um, I haven't seen any uh, much work in that direction. Maybe people can think about the smart ways to deal with the latency. And uh, even uh, uh, with uh, zero padding, if you put it, uh, say, if you put a zero padding or CP in each uh, uh, block, you are probably similar to uh, uh, pre-coded OFDM. So I don't see the complexity issue there either. So in that case, it's still latency from my point of view. Latency because of the equalization taking more time? Uh, I think uh, you uh, estimated the channel and... Uh... Estimating the channel is just reading the information yeah. from a specific region in delay dock. Yeah. Say so, if, so let's yeah, say you have the channel. Yeah, but, say, if, say if you need an uh, accurate uh, uh, Doppler, it's a bit of long time, but I think this is the same for OFDM as well. Oh yeah, it's the same. So let's say that yeah. we agree under the latency requirement of your system, you have a certain Doppler resolution and certain in the bandwidth. So the, under these constraints, yeah. measuring the channel is fast, and then yep. the source of latency is the iterations of the receiver. You need this iterated receiver. Uh, that, but, but I think, again, from the input that I got from, in, from, from the engineer that I talked with, um, this, is, this is now achievable. The, the, this, these receivers can be implemented in, in our world today. Yeah. The, the, the MRC receiver doesn't need many iterations. It converges pretty fast. That's once you give it the good, a good initial estimate, which is obtained uh, by the single tap equalization. So you, you basically, once you have 
you, you get a, a single tap equalization, which is the same cost as the OFDM. And then you, you do it, you iterate on that. And, uh, and the complexity is just MN times L, the number of delays. So that's, that's uh, I don't think that you can go any lower than that. You know, you, you kind of got rid of the, of the Doppler, uh, uh, multiple mm -hmm. Doppler for each delay. But once you go to there, there's not much less to do. It's, it's decision feedback in the end. And just yeah. the way we combine, maybe it's optimal. That, that's the, because of the MRC. Uh, but, but then that's, that's the reasonable complexity. I mean, we, we can run simulation of massive size uh, without problem. So, and even with multiple antenna, it, it can be done. So in terms, we don't need a supercomputer. We can run it on, on a desktop. So it's it's kind of promising that a chip could do that in uh, in real in real time. I I I, I would hope so. You know, and on latency, yeah. I would say uh, because we need to wait for m n number of samples to be received, we don't have symbol by symbol detection. That could be one source of it, which can be easily taken care of by by adjusting m and n. So, yeah. uh, and uh, also I think in terms of, there was a question on uh, how to choose M and N. I think personally, there should be a balance between them because we want to, M gives us the diversity in terms of the frequency, frequency diversity, if you like, and then time diversity is uh, taken from N dimension. So there, because of that, there should be uh, some balance there. Yes. But yeah, that's the designer's choice, I'd say. Yes. So, so there uh, will be a tra sorry, there will be a trade-off between M and N and the latency and the, so. the, the transmission yes, time. Yes, uh, then increase the latency. Mm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so just allow me to thank you for this discussion and uh, uh, because the time is up, and so the Peter Bobowski, Professor Peter, will do a concluding remark on behalf of the CDTC. And maybe we can have continue the discussion later. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So Peter, are there? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for organizing this, and thank you for the speakers and the panelists for the seminar. So I joined a little bit later, uh, because 7 o'clock in Europe was not the optimal time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I actually participated, at the, at the, uh, I was listening to the panel discussion, which was very interesting. So I will not repeat too many things, uh, just to say that uh, from what the panelists said, uh, it seems that we are redefining our understanding of time and frequency in uh, wireless communications, which is, a, which is a great venue for, for further research. And also, as Ronnie mentioned, uh, na, na, this is very suitable for joint sensing and communication, which is uh, one of the, I would say one of the most distinctive topic beyond 5G. I don't know whether we should say 6G or not. So I think in, in that sense, uh, it was, it was uh, it's very relevant and timely. Also, I have to say that uh, when we are thinking about these two plus one events in CTTC, we were actually thinking of 90 minutes in total, 20 minutes presentation, 20 minutes, and then uh, 45 minutes panel, <laughs> because we thought people will just drop out. But here I can see that there are more than 130 participants staying uh, a lot of three and a half hours, which I, I will have to probably rethink. Uh, either, either this topic was too interesting or in general, CTTC should make the longer meeting. So, so thank you very much. I have much. to tell you, there are not too many opportunities to give a talk which is long enough so that you can actually yeah. explain. So this is a great venue to actually study a topic. It's, it has a great potential. Yeah, okay, great. Yes. This, is a, this is a great input because I, I think you have two things. Either you can go to the topic in details, as you say, and you have your time to do a semi-tutorial or you invite speakers that would highlight just some points. For example, last time we had terahertz communication, we had one com theorist, one hardware practitioner, and then these are completely opposite viewpoints. So we so so th that's why they presented it briefly, and then there was a discussion between them. But here mm -hmm. you are both experts uh, on o OTFS, and of course you, you went into details, which is so it's, so it probably depends on the topic that we are going to deal with, right? And the guests. But uh, this my point is that when another feedback for me as a vice chair of CTC is is that this format is acceptable as well. Yeah. Thank you. Same computer. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. I think probably we have too many questions, <laughs> which is a good thing. Yes, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. impressive the amount of involvement. It's very mm -hmm. nice. Okay, just to tell you that we are going to organize another event like this in January, so stay tuned for for which topic that will be. Okay. Now I have a question about this uh, uh, this environment. So it also serves as a platform for paper submissions or articles. How does it? Uh, or only no. for? So. No, this is. This is the, uh, so the thing is that uh, we are organizing normally the communication theory workshop. Uh -huh. So the, the communication theory society does mostly two technical things, organize the communication theory workshop and uh, sponsors the communication theory symposia at Globcom and ICC. Mm -hmm. But this last year we could not have the workshop. So uh, when I was appointed as a vice chair, I thought, how do we keep things going? Mm -hmm. without without uh, this and then of course there that there were also too many online events so we had to think about a different format and having just one person talking maybe it's not the format so that's why we have two or more people joining so this is how this format came and uh, when the when the pandemic is hopefully soon over I, I hope we can still keep this format uh, you know to connect with people once in two months or something oh yeah I think it's great yeah. yes yeah, thanks for organizing. We really, I really personally enjoyed all the discussions, and everyone talks in the same language. <laughs> That's great. That's the best part. Yeah, yeah, we are in a we are in a same domain. Like, <laughs> thank you. Yes. A lot of attendees. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, it's, it was mostly the... And, uh, to organize this is very important. But just uh, uh, stay in tune that we have, uh, I think uh, this year we organized the uh, ICC first OTFS workshop at the ICC. Yeah. We proposed the second workshop. Uh, we slightly changed the name to be <laughs> OTFS uh, and the delayed Doppler domain signal processing. I think a lot of signal processing issues are relevant. Uh, so there will be, uh, I think uh, we propose for the ICC next year to 2022. 20, uh, 20, yes. So please submit the papers for all the audience. <laughs> I think yes. and the deadline of... is uh, January 20. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think most, uh, mostly thanks to Wei Jie and uh, Shuang Yuang for, for organizing this because it was their initiative. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, you very thank you very much. Thank you very much for all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Peter, maybe we can continue discussing in this uh, Zoom if channel. There's enthusiasm for that. Yes. Barry <laughs> <laughs> Rani is, uh, is very late. Yeah, I you. think yes. it's yes. probably. I already, late. you know, yes. I've already crossed my flipping zone. I can, I think, I, <laughs> I'm floating in space now. So, Ronnie, what time in Texas now? It's four, almost it's four, four, four a.m. Almost a four a.m. Oh. You can wake up. Four a.m. Wake... Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. That's Maybe. the excessive delay domain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. It's no. up to you, Beijing. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's good to conclude for the, for the okay. speakers because yeah, no problem. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, maybe I think Shraya and the Wei Jie, if you have to collect the other questions, they probably can 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 circulate and the people can exchange by emails as well. Sure. Yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. There sure. are quite a lot yeah. of questions. Yes. Yes, yes. And, yes. uh, and, uh, and Emanuele and Ronnie, please, uh, pro if possible, provide your slides so we can put them on the CCTC webpage. So I will send my slides to uh, Shuang Yang. Okay. 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 Yes. Thanks. Yes. Do the same. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and also, some some audience has asked if the recording videos can be shared. Oh, everything yeah. was recorded. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> If you didn't say anything controversially on the recording, so we can. <laughs> I'm not sure. So we we'll see if Ronnie and Emmanuel agree. I'm fine. Okay, thank you. I don't know where I am. It's okay. Mm. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. 
I mean, once you have the slide, it's the same. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do, you're going to speak on YouTube? YouTube? Well, what, so once you get Oh, uh, yeah, 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 we, we will upload it to YouTube. All right. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That's a great venue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're very good. Okay. okay, thank you all. Okay. You wish it. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you, Tina. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Bye. thank you for the good Bye. discussion. Bye. 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 Thank, Bye. You Bye. Yeah. Yeah. thank you all the audience as well. Thank you to all the audience. Yeah.